Hello and welcome back to my channel, Quirky What If. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off the first part of our series, What If Quirkless Opus Deku Got Harim. If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is American Theorist Bros from fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. Here is a small fact. Not all men are treated equally. I had that beaten into me by Katsuki Bakugo all those years ago. A person I called a friend who I respected and cared for. Now, he was unrecognizable, kicking a blue-haired girl for being a villain. What are you doing, Kaken? I stood in front of them, keeping my back towards that blue-haired girl. I'm showing her who's strong here. Not like you. Would understand that. I felt the absolute malice in his voice, and I felt fear of turning on who was my friend. But then, I looked behind me to see the brunette crying, with bruises along her face. Wait, she's older than me. Why? Would he pick on her? I didn't know why he decided to pick on her on that day. But I didn't care. I wasn't going to back down. Not for the world. Kakan, why are you doing this? He snickered sadistically, to which I was confused. Why do I have to explain myself? To the likes of you. For some reason, despite the fear in my heart, my head was already piecing things together. He's not our friend anymore. God, the thought at the time scared me. But what scared me more was that I would give in to that pressure and let everyone take advantage of me. My preschool teacher passed me over for just a kid who couldn't do anything on his own. I'd always have people making fun of me for just being quirkless. But now, Katsuki crossed a line. As he was about to reach me, I punched him in the gut, throwing him off of me. He went flying by a few feet, but he didn't move further back. He clutched his stomach, but the atmosphere became so thick that I felt suffocated by it. Katsuki, don't do this. Or what? He sneered at me while activating his quirk by smashing his hands together. I didn't like that expression on him. Arrogance, you'll stop me with your imaginary quirk. Hey, just because I don't have a quirk doesn't mean I can't be a hero. I yelled, despite my bruised arms and legs. I stood strong, despite me being outnumbered, three to one. Give it up, Deku. He sneered again like he was the only person who could ever become a hero. You will never be able to be a hero. You're worthless. He ran, this time, blinded by rage instead of his ego. His friends now were against me. Now, I was alone. Let's be heroes, like All Might. As I was falling unconscious, I remembered that time when we were three. Why? Why am I different from you now? I saw his eyes, looking down at me like I was an ant to him. I remember you and I watching All Might beating up bad guys. We both promised each other to be heroes. Why? Do you look at me like that? Like, I'm nothing to you. I didn't even register the pain. My mind started to process my loneliness before I could even feel like I had broken any bones. I'm all alone, I said as I passed out from Katsuki's punch. The next thing I knew, I felt someone else's tears falling onto my skin. I slowly opened my eyes to find myself being embraced by my mom. She was crying and crying, and all I could do was feel guilty as I remembered what happened. No, I have mom. I'm not alone. I remembered the video I watched, asking her if I could be a hero like All Might. She only apologized, but I just felt useless at that moment too. Just like I did at this moment. I can't do anything to comfort her. After all she's done for me. Izuku. She cried, wailing against my body. For a few minutes, we stayed like that. But then, she slowly pulled away from me, clearing her eyes in the process. I saw a new expression on her face, almost reflecting something inside me. Do you want to become a hero? Of course I do, I responded. Will you do anything it takes to become one? She already knew the answer to that. My expression hardened, and I just looked at her with all of the willpower and rage I had. I no longer looked like a four-year-old with warm, comforting eyes. Now, they were dulled, and the only thing that kept me up was Bakugou's expression. I won't let anyone else feel that weak. Ever again. Yes, I nodded. I want to be a hero, no matter what it takes, Mom. Usually, she'd shrug off my dream and worry about me. Now, she had no such expression in her eyes. All I saw was pride. She swallowed, but she didn't cry. Instead, she stood up and looked at me like I was twice my age. Let's go. I think I might know where you can achieve your dream. She said, giving me her hand, which I accepted. She walked me to the car where I had sat in the passenger seat. We drove down as we left our house, neighborhood, and community. I was going to ask her where we were going, but as I remembered what she had said to me, I stayed quiet. It was one of the quietest trips we had gone through, and throughout, I just looked back at her. She looked like she knew exactly what to do, just as I did. Eventually, after going far past our home, we saw a small martial arts studio on top of a mountain. That's a lot of stairs. I looked at the top of the mountain, my mom's hand still holding on to me. Come on, Izuku. Let's go. She looked like she was hardening her own expression like she was about to send me off to fight a war that she couldn't fight. But I nodded and walked the hundreds of steps to get up to the top of the mountain. Eventually, we walked to the front of the martial arts studio and knocked on the door. At first, we didn't hear anything, which made us worry for a bit. Is he gone? Hey, seconds later, we heard a man saying, I'm coming, I'm coming. Are you a new student? The person gruffly asked as he opened the door a crack. 
No, I wanted to get my son to join. My mom responded to the man. His eyes widened as he saw my mom, but it quickly fell. How old is he, and does he have a quirk? He asked, calmly. He is four years old, and no, he does not have a quirk. Sorry, I can't help you. He closed the door, and my mom immediately pounded on the door again. Please, you have trained people who were quirkless. My mom's voice rang out. He opened the door a crack again, but he sounded like he wanted to not talk to her again. Like, she reminded him of something bad. I did, but they were above a certain age. A person's body, if they do not have the determination to pull through and become the best at using martial arts, will fail. Most children under the age of 10 don't have that determination. My son does. My mom's tone suddenly became deadly serious, lacking any empathy for the person she was speaking to. He wanted to save someone he barely knew from bullies, and he would jump into a battle if he knew he could save someone. He is determined to become a hero. He gasped in confusion, like he didn't expect that, but dropped the tone, opting for a more compassionate one. Are you sure you want to subject your child to such rigorous training? It isn't easy to learn the technique of fist of flowing water, crushed rock. He sounded regretful, like this was all too familiar to him. Ask him. He is right here after all. She pointed to me behind the door. The man had opened the door fully, and I saw what he looked like. He had spiked white hair, a black, full sleeve shirt, and white pants. His features suggested he was old, showing a wrinkled face, with rough skin and his face seemed to convey that he was put through a lot in his life. Betrayal was one of the emotions I saw on his face, along with deja vu, as if he saw someone else in me. Young man, he crouched down to my height, and he put his finger under my chin, looking at me sympathetically. Do you truly want to learn this? You will face a lot of hardships from learning it. Even though it will be very rewarding in the end, for the first few years, you will be in great pain from the work you will have to do. Unaffected, I say, yes, I do want to join. I wanted to become a hero, but I was made fun of by my friends, who wanted nothing to do with me after they gained quirks, and I didn't. They beat me up and made me feel weak. I never want to feel weak again. I don't want anyone to feel weak again. At first, he was stunned by what I had said. His eyes widened, and he stopped breathing for several seconds. Then, the wrinkles in his face relaxed as he smiled, like he was looking in the mirror, and he knew what I felt like. He rubbed his soft hand over my head of hair in an affectionate way. All right, I will train him to be the strongest. He looked up towards my mom for a single second, then looked at me with kind eyes. You will be able to achieve that dream of yours. He would never know how right he was. A decade had passed, and now I was getting ready for my last few days at middle school. 7.30 a.m. I was outside my apartment, surrounded by two arms, keeping me in a warm embrace. Mom, I asked. She didn't speak, but I guess she didn't need to. Well done, I felt her say. Thank you for believing in me when no one else did. My hug conveyed that message to her. By the look she gave me, she understood what I had meant. After a kiss on the cheek, I went on my way. I've gotten stronger, haven't I? I lifted my shirt up, revealing my hidden six-pack abs. With my uniform on, I couldn't even tell that I was any less scrawny than I was years prior. But now, I knew I wasn't weak anymore. As I walked to the train station, the beach on my left shined, with the crystal clear waters reflecting into my eyes. Even in the early spring, it looked amazing. That was hell to clean up. I couldn't even imagine it as dirty anymore. Or maybe my mind blocked it from looking dirty inside my mind, almost shielding me from the amount of pain I had to go through in order to clean it. Damn, I really was weak back then. I chuckled at something that my past self would have found hard. Running across the beach, I took off my shoes and socks and my uniform and laid them to the side, carrying only my phone in my pocket. Then, I ran. I imagined seeing hundreds of people cheering me on like I was racing. Everyone had a board up, cheering for me. Bakugo looked happy, cheering me on. Everyone was cheering me on, wanting me to win the race. They all cared about me. They still had fear in their eyes, but it wasn't of me. They feared me losing. I smiled and pushed through, running my pace as fast as I could go. I crossed the checkered line, and everyone erupted with cheers with me. They were proud of me for winning. Everyone rushed down to get a picture taken or get a hug in, and my mother hugged me in front of the camera, and we both smiled at the pictures. But that thought disappeared within a blink of an eye when I heard the beeping of my phone. I immediately opened it up and looked at it. 14 minutes. That's a minute faster than usual. As I got back to reality, the truth set in. That would never happen if I didn't do anything about it. I shouldn't let myself drift off like that. Someone could have gotten hurt. As I walked, I checked the time on my watch. 7.45 a.m. Perfect timing. I quickly ran to middle school and got into class by 8.30, 15 minutes before the bell. I sat in the classroom and pulled out the assignments that I needed to turn in. I looked up, with students still pouring into the classroom. They didn't look at me, and some looked disgusted with being in my presence. But I was in my own world then. I've grown. I've changed, even from then. One month ago, Master, I said, taking off my shoes while bowing towards him with respect, and came on the dojo's wooden floor. Yes, Izuku. You haven't been here in a while, have you? He said softly. What ails you? I have come to ask, how have I improved compared to people with quirks? I said, revealing no arrogance, glee, or expectation. You have improved to the point where you can be able to achieve that dream you had told me of. 
you have the strength and a mind that makes sure that now, no one can now claim that you are powerless without being out of their mind. He and I shared a laugh, and I could only just think of the years beforehand. Too weak. Stand, Izuku. He told me then. I stood, and kept my stance all those years ago, despite my arms having been drained of all their strength. I later limped back home, with my arms and legs having deep gashes in them, ever since I joined. Oi, Deku, Bakugou yelled years before. I hid my hiss and ignored him, stumbling back home. Don't, call me Deku. Oi, I felt a punch, and the next thing I knew, I was sent flying. However, I didn't falter, instead, I started posing like a wolf, with my weight evenly divided between all of my limbs. Huh, so you've lost it and tried becoming an animal. His laugh was disgusting. At that moment, he reinforced the same idea that I had on that day. This world doesn't treat us as equals. However, I was weaker than him, so I couldn't do anything about it. I will get stronger than you. I was prepared to fight back. With a step, I felt my muscles contract and nearly collapse. I was going to lose before even getting strong enough. That's enough, children. Master Bang stepped in then. He kept me behind him and protected me. More than once, he helped me without anything in return. He didn't even charge my mom or me for the lessons, just wanting credit for his technique, fist of flowing water, crushed rock. Thank you, master. You've kept me on this path, even when I was too weak to do so. Thank you. Actually, why don't we test that? He challenged, as he set up his stance. Why don't we have a sparring match, one-on-one? -on -one? Are you sure, master? I asked. I knew he was sure. If he was challenging someone, he was dead serious, and he wouldn't pull back his punches. Bakigu might remember that challenge all too well. He lost to it after all. Yes, let's spar. You have gone in many tournaments now, haven't you? He said. He was right. Over the years, I competed in many tournaments, from breaking concrete blocks to showing my creative form to, yes, sparring, I have won every single one since I was eight. Yes, but none of them involved fighting you, I pointed out, matter-of-factly. I suppose that's true. Despite himself, there was a certain level of pressure I felt from him. He wasn't going to pull any punches today with me. Come, Izuku, show that you can overcome me, and make the student surpass the teacher. The first person who hit the other wins. He got into his stance with a grin on his face. I couldn't turn down when he said it like that. It just pumped me up for what I was going to do in that fight. Yes, sir. He took a new stance, one that I hadn't seen before outside of him using it on. Back you go. He used the same stance. If that's the stance he'll want to take. I didn't get intimidated by his stance, despite me remembering him sending Bakugou flying using that same stance. The atmosphere became so tense, I could hardly breathe. But I did. I didn't let myself become intimidated by his stance and stood strong in my ready stance. If I fail, I'd fail my master. I can't do that. I can't be intimidated by him. I felt my heart beat through my chest, but I still stood strong. But, I was frozen in place. I couldn't attack. So he made the first attack, punching me at my side. He did it quickly, but I moved quicker and moved to the side, dodging his quick punch. However, I knew that wasn't going to be the only thing my master was capable of. Remember what I said, young man. My master said, don't overthink your situation, otherwise someone will react and defeat you beforehand. Have you learned nothing that I have taught you? I swallowed the guilt, but stood strong, not being intimidated by my master. I quickly stepped in and tried to kick his knee and shin to make him go down while faking a punch. But of course, he anticipated that and tried to kick in my head. I stepped back, and, without any successful hits on either of us, I moved back. Damn it, I need to land something on him. He took this time to attack, but I knew he would do this and moved behind him and planted a sidekick on his back. He jumped back, with his fists whitening with how tight he kept them. He looked desperate to finish the fight. It was the longest single-point sparring session that either of us had ever been in, and clearly, he was giving it his all. He started using the fist of flowing water, crushed rock to try to hit me, but every time he missed. Move after move, I dodged every single move he made and saw an opening. His head. He isn't defending it. I smiled, as I saw an opening from the multiple jabs, slashes, and slices from his hands. I went behind him to try to kick his leg. He jumped over it, and, for the millisecond that he wasn't using his technique, I did a quick jab to try to get the point, and I landed it. Unfortunately, since I was so hyped on adrenaline from dodging his attacks, the light jab I meant to do sent him flying into the wall, creating a huge amount of dust. Master, I yelled. From the dust that was created, I saw a shadowy figure, one in the shape of my master, and he said, don't worry, I am fine. That was a strong punch you got there. The dust then cleared, but I saw that his confident face that I used to see from him had shattered, and all that was present was a pained expression. Sorry, master. I immediately bowed to him. I didn't mean for it to be that strong. Then, I heard him chuckle. I saw his expression change from one of pain to one of pride. He laughed, a wholesome and kind-hearted laugh, as I looked at him, confused. Well then, the student truly has become the master. He said with pride, with not a hint of anger or sadness. That means I have nothing more to teach you, Izuku. Congratulations, my boy. You really have grown. I started crying, and I hugged him. He seemed shocked by my hug, but he reciprocated the hug and patted me on the back. Eventually, I pulled away, and I vowed to come back here when I had gotten into UA. Then, afterward, I ran several miles to go back home. 
I eventually reached home, and I saw my mom waiting for me at the door. Mom, what? I wasn't able to ask my question before my mother immediately hugged me, softly. Unlike the hug I remember, it didn't feel like desperation, even though she was crying. She felt loose, and, when she pulled away, she was smiling, not a fake one, like the one she would use when I was injured from working too hard, but a genuine smile, one with real happiness and pride behind it. I heard from your master, and he said that you beat him in a sparring match. You beat the best martial artist in the world. She looked like she was going to cry tears of joy again, with her smile never waning. I am proud of you, son. At times, I was worried about your health, but I never stopped believing in you. Now, you have become so strong, and without becoming like the people who have hurt you. She then proceeded to hug me tightly for a few seconds, before pulling back. Hey, for your victory, I will make your favorite katsudan. She said as she opened the door and we both went in. I waited by the table, as she told me to, and she gave me my favorite dish. I said, thank you for the meal, and took my time to really enjoy the food instead of rushing to eat it, like I would eat other foods. Katsudan was, and still is, one of the foods that, for me, I ate for pleasure and taste, rather than just eating it to survive and get stronger. I savored the taste of it, along with the smell, and my body relaxed to the food. I finished the bowl of katsudan and asked my mother for seconds, knowing, after this point, I might not be able to enjoy it thoroughly. I finished the second bowl of katsudan and stopped in front of my mom. I smiled and I bowed to my mother, thank you, mom, both for the meal and for supporting me. She touched my back, indicating me to stand up, and she hugged me for the final time that day and said, I'm your mom. As long as you aren't hurt and you aren't hurting anyone, I will always support you. Those words inspired me, and I vowed, from that day and onwards, to never severely worry my mother. I assume you all want to be heroes, my teacher said, snapping me out of my thoughts, and, as I saw many other people being excited, I raised my hand determinedly. Now, excluding Midoriya, you all have wonderful quirks, my teacher said, calling me out and making everyone chuckle at me. I scoffed and chuckled myself, knowing how little they knew about me. But make sure you don't use it in school. Hey teach, don't lump me in with these losers. Bakugo came in, interrupting the teacher and the students. Many of the students didn't look visibly happy, and some even started yelling at him, even though they knew Bakugo's abilities and his anger management problems. So, you are also going to UA High School. The teacher said. Everyone exclaimed about how UA was so hard to get into, but I didn't really care. Also, who else is going? Bakugo screamed, with his eyes and tone leaking venom into the atmosphere, while he looked around the room. Why, the quirkless Izuku is going as well, the teacher said cockily. My teacher threw me under the bus. I sighed as I stood up. However, I know what to expect. In less than three seconds, everyone will turn around and say the words that I have gotten used to by this point. You can't be a hero. Screw that. I will become a hero, and no one will stop me, I said with no hesitation, with confidence sparkling within my voice. However, I knew exactly what was going to happen, and I knew no one would take that seriously. In their mind, it was like trying to become the best despite being the worst. Everyone had laughed at that, especially Bakugou. Oh my goodness, you really are a loser and an idiot, are you Deku? He said as he calmed down from laughing so hard. He wiped his imaginary tears off his face and said, You think a quirkless nobody like you can get into the best school in the nation? Yes, I know I can, I said, as a powerful, almost angry aura appeared around me, breaking my stoic demeanor while surprising everyone in the room. I will become a hero, a better one than you. You're too self-absorbed. You haven't changed in the past ten years. I have. That pissed Bakugou, to the point he was using his quirk. Using it, Bakugou sped towards me and crashed through the wall. He broke through it, and destroyed the science classroom next door, and the next two classrooms, before stopping in the middle of another class. I looked through it, and I saw everyone look at me. My teacher was pissed, but not at Bakugou. M-I-D-O-R-I-Y-A. B-A-K-U-G-O-U. Office now. I groaned. But, I reluctantly walked out of the classroom and towards the principal's office, with me crossing my fingers. I sat down, with Bakugu coming later. The principal came to meet with us, and he sighed while looking at us. Now, Midoriya, what you did was unacceptable. You threatened Bakugu's life and made him feel unsafe, forcing him to use his quirk on you. You will be facing consequences. You will be forced to do detention today, and you will be required to pay for the damages you have caused. The principal said to me as he handed me a bill. I was furious, but I didn't let it show yet. He showed me the bill, and, despite the overwhelming amount of money they asked me to pay, my expression stayed purposely blank. On the inside, I was filled with rage. Because of something I didn't even do, I was going to pay, which would be more than what my mother and I earn over ten months. All because I spoke out. All because of an insult. I looked at the now mummified Katsuki. He looked even more furious than I was, looking ready to explore the entire building if one bad thing happened. After the principal spoke, he exploded. What the fuck are you talking about? Me, afraid of a quirkless nobody. Are you a... He stopped as his mom came after hearing what happened to him, presumably. Brett, you are picking on weaker kids again. How dare you hurt Izuku again, after he didn't touch you. Ms. Bakugou stormed in, already letting out a yell so loud, that it could shatter eardrums. Ah, uh, hello Ms. Bakugou. He looked at her, entering the office at the right time. He didn't even flinch to her yelling. Though, what do you mean? 
Well, principal, from what I know, Izuku would never hurt nor threaten a person's life. Even if he did, he's quirkless. You'd think that people without a quirk would be able to even hurt someone else's life, much less someone with a powerful quirk like my son. I hated what she said, her looking down on me, but I stayed silent. It was the only way I could get out of it. She also didn't know how strong I had gotten. The principal considered her words. Well, that is a good point, but why would Bakugo attack him if he hadn't been aggravated or attacked? My brat over here, he likes to think he is superior to everyone else, and whoever doesn't listen will be made sure that they. She suddenly looked at me, scanning my body for recent cuts and burns. She found none visible. Wait, you don't even have any scars or burn marks. How? He tried attacking me, and I moved out of the way. He plowed through several classrooms with his attack. She rubbed her temples like she wanted to prevent an incoming migraine. How you were able to dodge this brat's attack is beyond me, but the important thing is that none of you are hurt. She dismissed my strength like I was weak. I swallowed my anger because she didn't do it out of malice, just ignorance. But, it still didn't sit right with me. I will pay for any of the damages. This brat was the one who caused it, so I will be responsible for it, said Ms. Bakugu as she slapped her son for the bill. I guess you are right, Ms. Bakugu. Izuku, you are still going to be in detention. I was still angry, but I knew if I questioned it anymore, I would end up with heavier consequences. Okay, you two are dismissed to your classes. I left the office shortly after. Oi, Izuku, meet me after detention. I turned towards Ms. Bakugu, who called after me, with an expression I hadn't seen on her face. She looked, worried. I raised my eyebrow, but nodded nonetheless. The school day passed like any other, and I went to detention. It was mostly boring. But, wherever I sat, everyone just moved away, not wanting to get the weakness from me. That was beaten over my head during detention, when I saw actually regular offenders, with drug usage and gang violence, alongside quirkless individuals like me, who I knew had no business being inside this detention class. I just did the small amount of work I needed to do, and just avoided everyone else. It was the only thing I could do. But, afterward, I walked outside, where I saw Ms. Bakugu outside her car. Oi, Izuku, how are you doing? She wore an unnatural smile, one that I didn't respond to. Not much for small talk, huh? She dropped her smile and looked at me like I was foreign to her. How? Did you dodge him? Katsuki, despite his arrogance, is a strong person. So am I, Ms. Bakugu. I quickly interrupted her. She was surprised by my quick answer, but I knew she wasn't going to be convinced by words. Plus, Bakugu isn't exactly smart. He makes himself easy to dodge if you actually see him do it beforehand. He keeps himself wide open because he doesn't think that anyone would ever hurt him or that he could ever miss or lose. A bittersweet smile spread across her face. You've changed, haven't you? I raised my eyebrow but stayed silent. She sighed, looking down. I remember that I wasn't even at home when he had caused that to you. He didn't bring it up, and your mom didn't even tell me. The police didn't either. This gray-haired guy randomly knocked on the door, telling me what happened. And Ko didn't even mention it to me. She looked down, her lips tight. Look, I'm sorry, Izuku. She looked at me with pride. But, I'm glad you've changed. You've become stronger now. She lifted her face, and I saw her teasing voice coming out of her mouth. Who knows? You might get a few women drooling over you in a couple of years. I narrowed my eyes to her. Jeez. She laughed, which made me soften my expression. I really couldn't get mad at her. She was a good friend with my mom, and I didn't want what was between Bakugu and I to interfere with their friendship. Though, seriously, you'll have a ton of girlfriends soon enough. Mark my words. I sighed. Thanks, I guess. I didn't exactly know how to respond to that. Anyways, thanks for listening to me. You're a good kid. Stay that way. She sat in her car and waved goodbye. Then, my mom appeared shortly after Ms. Bakugu left. Are you okay, son? She asked as we went to the car and opened the driver's seat door. The car, despite it being almost a decade old, was in near-mint condition, with no mud, dirt, or even dust apparent on, in, or around the vehicle. I guess when you primarily walk to school, things change. Yeah, I don't have a scratch on me. I opened the door to go into the passenger seat. However, my lips thinned as I mustered the truth about me. People still call me weak. I looked down as I sat in the car, almost ashamed. My mom just looked concerned. Then why don't you show them that you are strong? You have defeated the best martial artist in the world. She faced me, giving me her undivided attention. Then something like this would happen. If I showed them my strength, they would think that I am someone like Garu. I looked up towards her. Garu, who's that? I'll explain, Mom. She still didn't move the car or even turn it on. Though, can you turn on the car? It's a little warm. Then here. Oh. My mom quickly fiddled with the keys, dropping them, before picking them up again, and then, starting the car. The AC turned on, and it took a while to actually start. But, when it did start, I felt much cooler. I felt the AC blowing on my face, and felt my body temperature lower. I closed my eyes, resting on the back headrest. He was a person who, through sheer determination and hard work, became so powerful that he could defeat almost everyone. She looked at me with surprise, but, a surprising amount of familiarity. He was quirkless like me, and people thought he was weak because of it. People picked on him and hurt him. But, when he became strong, he hurt anyone who was in his way. Heroes, villains, they all fell to him. 
The only person who was able to beat him was One Punch Man, who was a quirkless pro hero who would be able to beat all of the other pro heroes without even giving it his all. I spoke with a little bit of pride as I said the last part, smiling with my eyes closed. But, after they died, they were mostly treated as exceptions, and they repeated the cycle. They fear that, I'll become like Garu. But you aren't like Garu. You are more like the One Punch Man. You want to be a hero, she said with unrivaled faith in me. Yeah, but with great power comes great responsibility. So I can't fault them for fearing me, considering there is no way to control me. I say disappointedly, which doesn't go unnoticed by my mom. Okay, so what do you want me to do? She said calmly. I want to be able to handle this, because, once they get to know me, they will think twice before either fearing or feeling superior to people like me. I say with confidence, and with nothing that could indicate that I didn't believe what I said. She laughed as she drove out of the school. I had a feeling you would say that. That is one of the reasons I love you. Yeah, I love you too, mom. She pulled out of the parking space, and I just rested against the seat. Eventually, we left the school and reached home. But, she didn't switch the car off. Yeah, mom. She looked at me, seriousness in her eyes, and asked, So, when are you getting a girlfriend? I was confused by where this was coming from, as she never asked me about that. Honestly, I am not sure. I don't know whether I should even be dating now. You should, otherwise, you will miss your life. My grandfather did that, and he left my mother with my mom, as he needed to be a hero. Wait, our grandfather was a hero. She smiled. Yeah, apparently. Apparently. That made me confused. But besides that, I know that there are going to be people out there who would love you besides me. Plus, I want grandchildren someday. She teased, with the expectation of me being a blushing mess. Mom, please don't say that, I already had a small blush on my face. Well, it is true. But, you don't have to have a girlfriend right now, as there is a lot of pressure that you have. But, I am sure, once you get into UA, you will be able to have multiple girlfriends. She said, again, teasing me. Mom, I groaned, dreading actually meeting another girl. However, at that moment, I didn't know how right she was. I was running, faster than I have ever run before, at over 80 miles per hour. Unlike the people running away however, I was running towards danger, all to prevent a person's death. Everyone who saw me running was calling me to stop, to turn back, but I didn't listen. Thinking of my dream, to save others and give others hope, I jumped the robot's full height, and, with the power of a nuclear bomb, I raised my fist and yelled out, as loud as I could while punching the robot to the ground. Hiroshima smash. Half an hour ago. I was walking to the exam location when I felt someone push me to the side. I looked over and saw Katsuki had walked past me after he pushed me out of his way. Anger flowed through me, but I calmed myself quickly since I didn't want to cause an unnecessary fight. I walked past him and inside the location, where I had to sit next to Katsuki because we were in the same school. When I sat down, I thought of some strategies. Should I use my strength, or use the fist of flowing water crushed rock technique? The latter would be best used against humans or people with human weaknesses, but brute strength would be used in times where I need to beat a strong enemy. Of course, there are other options, but those are the most simple and the first to come to my mind. A man with blonde, spiky hair, sunglasses, and a heavy speaker system on his neck came onto the stage, interrupting my thoughts. As he came onto the stage, his clothing became apparent, wearing black boots, a black jacket with beige shoulder pads, and black pants. I wrote about heroes and drew them in the hero journals I made, 1 minus 13, so I knew who he was, Hizashi Yamada, also known as Present Mike. His quirk, called voice, makes him able to amplify his voice, either in volume or in pitch. I was interested in why he was here, but I had to hear what he said. Welcome to today's live performance. Everyone say hey. He said with passion. However, no one responded. I see he looks a little annoyed, but he discarded his expression before anyone else noticed, and said, Well, that's cool, my examinee listeners. I'm here to present the guidelines of your practical. Are you ready? More silence came from the audience. Now, many of the people could now see his annoyed expression, but he discarded it again to explain the practical exam. He then went on to explain the test, and how we had to destroy robots to get the most amount of points. One guy then pointed out how there were four, but then present Mike addressed it by saying that the fourth type of enemy gave no points, and was more of an obstacle than anything else, while the others gave one, two, or three points respectively. That's all from me. I leave my listeners with our school motto. The great hero Napoleon Bonaparte once said, True heroism consists in being superior to the ills of life. Plus ultra. Break a leg everyone. After his announcement, I went to go for the practical examination. I remember that the test consists of us fighting robots in the replica of a city. However, it's to scale, so I would need to move significantly faster. It looks as big as the city back home, having wide streets, several stories, high buildings, and other things that the city I lived in had, so I know that I would have to push 60 miles per hour to go across the city quickly. I then looked at the people around me, who were either talking or saying how the city looked massive. Huh, looks like everyone forgets that this is a test. I know they would be dazed when present Mike starts the exam, giving me a three seconds head start before the first person reacted, and around five for the rest of them reacting. 
I thought before preparing myself for the signal from present Mike, not wasting time talking or other things. So, looks like the technique and the teachings of Master Bang will not come into play today, I thought, disappointed. But, what it does mean is that I can still be able to pass the exam. The strength that I have gained should come in handy when everyone is behind me. I remember standing up for that one kid who was being bullied by Katsuki and thought of all I have gone through to get here. I smiled, temporarily weakening my stoic demeanor. Everything that I have done has come together to this moment. Now, I can't disappoint everyone. Mom, Master Bang, they're counting on me. I was now ready. Present Mike then said go, surprising everyone except me. I ran 60 miles per hour and beat up every robot in sight in three seconds, causing a temporary shock from the exam takers before they suddenly realized what was happening. One pointers, two pointers, three pointers, they all fell down as soon as I saw them. I jumped off the sides of buildings, punched through them, and kept going. Every time I destroyed a robot I felt an enormous amount of power flowing through me, and right now, I wield the power of Garu. After a significant amount of time had passed, and after I destroyed most of the robots, I began to calculate my score. Wait, 80 points. That's higher than I thought I would get. How strong can I be? As if someone had read my thoughts, one of the zero pointers showed up. Many people ran away from it. I was going to avoid the zero point robot in particular until I saw someone was trapped in the way of the robot. She was a brunette, she had a round face, and she, at that moment, looked terrified. Her legs were crushed under rubble, and she couldn't move. I knew I had to save her. She looked scared. She has the same look I had when I was defending that kid against Katsuki. Her life may end before it has begun. I have to save her. Otherwise, what kind of hero am I? I said a slightly altered quote from All Might, There is nothing to fear because I am here. Before running to the robot using my strength to make the multi-story high robot crumble. I punched so hard that I went through the robot. I was going to fall into one of the buildings and possibly get injured, but I quickly realized what was happening and rebounded off of one of the buildings on an angle, so I wouldn't absorb the full amount of force, and, even though the building would be weakened, it wouldn't fall. I rebounded against a few buildings, before making it safely on the ground, not totally unscathed, but I had no injuries. I then looked at where the robot once stood. The Zero Pointer, once towering over everything, now laid on the ground in pieces. Then Present Mike has said the test has finished. After I had seen the girl with her legs under the rubble calm down, I offered her my hand to help her up, and sincerely asked, are you all right? She looked up, and, for a second, I saw her blush. I was confused until I realized that, in my act to save her, my shirt had been torn apart, and she was looking at me shirtless. Ignoring my pounding heart and slight embarrassment, I asked again, Are you okay? She then shook her face and said, in a sweet voice, Yeah, thanks to you. She then accepted my hand, then tried to stand up without using me for support, but then immediately, her legs and ankle buckled with the bruising on it, and she began to fall down. I grabbed her by her arms before she could fall, and gently placed one of her arms around my neck and shoulder to support her. Sorry if this makes you uncomfortable, but I have to get you to the nurse, and you clearly aren't in a state to walk. Is that okay? I turned my head towards her. She then nodded her head, blushing again, as her face turned heavily pink as she probably realized how close she was to me and faced away from me. Huh, where's the nurse? I finally looked at the people around me. Everyone's jaws were wide open, and they looked stunned. I didn't know whether that was bad or good. Then, the people taking the test said, How did you do that? How were you able to take down that zero pointer? With no sympathy, and with some venom in my voice, I said, The answer is simple, because I actually did what a hero is supposed to do, save people from harm, regardless of the situation. Now, if you would be so kind as to move instead of standing around, I need to get her to the nurse's office. I said as I tried to balance the person's weight on me. Everyone shut up and moved out of my way so I could carry the person to the nurse's office. I balanced her weight on me and started walking towards the main building. She seemed quiet, and she was blushing quite a bit, and she looked cute, but I wouldn't admit that to her. Hey, what's your name? The girl I was carrying said as we were walking, snapping me out of my thoughts. Oh, my name is Izuku Midoriya. What's yours? I said, now realizing we were in the main building, and trying to navigate the place. Achako Uraka. She waited for a few minutes before saying, thank you for saving me. It was nothing. I bet anyone else would be able to beat it. I said humbly, fully believing that statement. If anyone had the courage to save her, they would have been able to. You saved my life. You acted like a true hero. What's your quirk? I don't have one, I said seriously. I instantly regretted it. What? How? She suddenly yelled out. Please do not yell, you're Raka, I say while wincing at her loud voice. Oh, sorry, she apologized. But how could you be able to take that robot down without a quirk? Through a hell of a lot of training, I admitted while shivering, and a lot of determination and drive. I worked for ten years of my life so I could become a hero. I said as the nurse's office was in sight. Why did you want to become a hero? She asked curiously, all signs of blushing and embarrassment removed from her face. Because I wanted to save people from harm, give hope to the hopeless, and inspire others like me to become a hero, I said seriously, as Uraka's eyes widened from hearing that. Wow, that is an incredibly noble and selfless goal. It makes me feel like my reason for being a hero is pathetic. 
she said as the sadness crept into her voice. Hey, no matter the reason, the fact that you want to be a hero, and not anything else, means that you want to save others from harm, don't you? I said with a smile, trying to cheer her up. Yes, I do want to save others. She said, removing the sadness from her voice. Let's be heroes together. Yeah. I smiled at her innocent personality, and her voice made me happy. My heart started beating irregularly, I felt more aware, and my breathing slowed. Her smile and face, it makes me feel a certain way. My body feels warm with her smile. I have no idea what I am feeling, whether it is love or infatuation. But, I know that, whether love, infatuation, or anything else, my determination must not falter. I need to become a hero. I can't have whatever I am feeling get in the way, otherwise, I would be compromised, and I couldn't be able to achieve my dream. I need to stay focused. I slightly scolded myself for feeling whatever I was feeling, even though it was foreign to me. Anyway, thank you for bringing me here to the nurse's office. She said as I realized we were at the nurse's office. I moved her arm off of me, and I saw her look slightly disappointed, before I carried her bridal style, making her entire face red with embarrassment before I placed her on the hospital-like bed. No problem. I hope I will see you soon at school. I said as I walked away. I have to ignore whatever I am feeling. It is the only way to become a hero. I thought as I walked out. Hey, Midoriya. Hem, I said, turning around to see her face once again. Thank you for saving my life. She said, smiling as widely as she could, despite the pain she was feeling. I was going to reiterate that anyone else could have saved her, but, instead, I said, you're welcome. You deserve to live your life as a hero. See you at school. She looked like she was surprised, but then nodded and said, bye. I walked back home that day, feeling calm, but uneasy. My emotions were all over the place, but I had to push through. I have to become a hero. A week later, my mom had gotten the mail and saw UA High School on the letter. She gave it to me, so I went to my room, not entirely knowing what to expect. I opened it up and saw a small projector. I put it on my desk in my room and saw All Might. This is a projection. I heard loudly. I slightly chuckled at All Might pointing out the obvious, before I stopped and thought. Wait, why is All Might in this? He is the symbol of peace, not a teacher at UA, who are the ones who are being recorded as they give the results. Unless, my eyes widened as I realized why All Might would be here. Well, Izuku Midoriya, you have done an amazing job, and the reason I am on this, giving your exam results to you here, is that I am going to be teaching at UA. He said, confirming my thoughts. So, I hope that. Wait, I will have to do more of these. How many? Someone said a number in the background that I wasn't able to fully hear, but, due to the fact that all might side, it seemed like he had to do a lot of these after mine. Well, I guess I will get to the point. On the written portion, you had achieved a perfect score. In the practical, you also demonstrated heroism in the face of that zero-pointer, and you have gotten 80 points, higher than any other person taking the test this year. I was proud when I heard that score. But, it seemed like he wasn't finished, as he took a massive breath in, before saying. However, and I hate to say this, but, due to the nature of your power, many teachers and students showed fear of you. Others said how you weren't strong enough to be a hero. Some outright denied to have you in the school. But what many of the teachers had said was that you can't be a hero. He said somberly. I looked downward, sort of expecting this, but not hoping it to happen. Tears slowly and softly leaked out of my eyes. My once stoic face broke down, and now, I felt empty. Tears continually poured down from my eyes, and I couldn't stop it. I knew this was going to happen. Why though? Why am I being stopped from achieving my dream because of the fact that I don't have a quirk? I asked myself rhetorically. Why can't I just save people and give hope to the hopeless? That's all I've wanted to do. Why? What was all that work for? I remember the time when I had defended myself against Katsuki's quirk, and yet, I was blamed. I then remembered the multiple times I had been separated from others because I had no quirk. I had to work a multitude of times harder than everyone else did. However, when I had proven my strength, many people acted in fear of me, unlike my goal to give hope to the hopeless. It was either that I was a weakling who wasn't deserving of respect, or I was a powerful person who was to be feared and contained, only because they couldn't understand me, or they couldn't deal with me. I was about to shut it off, but one, I realized that there was no shut-off button, and two, it wasn't done. But, some people, including me, felt like convincing the teachers. All Might said smugly as a screen appeared behind him and he backed away from it. I slowly stopped crying and wiped my tears off of my face after I had realized what he had said. All Might stood up for me. Wait, he said others. Who else stood up for me? I thought, more confused than sad now. As if the screen had read my mind, I saw Yuraka along with the other students who had taken the test with me crowding around present Mike. Hello, are you present Mike? One student said. We wanted to ask about Izuku Midoriya. Many other students came in to say at the same time. I wasn't sure if that was coordinated until I saw them weirded out, and they stopped their sync speaking. Everyone started describing me, from the freckles on my face, to my curly green hair, to a lot of other things, like face shape, and a lot of people said I looked plain, which I found to be slightly laughable that they would find the stoic, bland nature of my face to be a defining characteristic of who I was. However, I listened to them anyway, curious about where this would go. Will he go into UA? Yuraka asked at once, silencing everyone around her. Everyone looked expectantly at present Mike. He sighed. No, 
he said in a serious voice, surprising everyone. Most of the teachers didn't want him in their classroom. He is quirkless, and we can't guarantee he will go down the path of a hero because of that. Also, despite his strength, he is nowhere near the strength of a person with a quirk, so, for those reasons, he can't be a hero. So, their logic is that, if I ever feel like I don't want to be a hero, they can't stop me. Why would they obstruct my dream and my work just because they don't know if they can control me? I was close to losing my cool, but I didn't explode yet. Everyone looked stunned, but, for a few seconds, no one said anything. Well, your Raka came in, sounding serious, if he can't be a hero, and if he isn't strong enough, then I don't deserve to be one either. Let him take my place instead. Huh, I said, along with present Mike, confused again, the anger I had mostly evaporated. No, mind, he is a true hero. More students began to speak out. No, have him take my place. He is nobler than I could ever be. Everyone who had taken the test with me had yelled out to either to convince him by saying what I had done that made me deserving of being in UA or were asking to give up their positions as long as I got in. Present Mike looked overwhelmed with the number of people supporting me, while I was inspired by the overwhelming amount of people who had sided with me, regardless of what they had been told. All these guys, despite the amount of hatred I showed them, they have sided with me. I should definitely apologize to them. I felt guilty for what I had said before. I have a 200 IQ, I should act like I am that intelligent. But, the person I will need to thank, feelings aside, is your Raka. Maybe I am blinded by infatuation, but she has stood up for me, inspiring others to as well, when no one would have stood up for me otherwise. I also have to make sure that I surpass their expectations of me. I need to make sure that I deserve their fight for me. Then, All Might came behind present Mike, resting his giant hands over present Mike's shoulders in the video, and said to everyone, If a quirkless person like young Midoriya can inspire and save people, then who are we to turn them down? That would go against everything we have stood for. So, with that in mind, Izuku Midoriya is allowed to go to you if he has a high enough score on his practical and the writing portion. Then, the video stopped, and then, All Might came in front of the screen, almost eclipsing it with his torso. And you did. Not only did you get the highest score in this year's practical test and written test but, because of your actions, you have gotten extra points. That zero pointer was a test, and it was seen to test the resolve of the future heroes. We awarded people who had stopped at rescue points. You were the only one who stepped in, so you have gotten an extra 70 points, 10 from each of our 7 judges. With that, you have the highest score of 150. That is 50 points higher than what I had achieved. So, congratulations Izuku Midoriya. This will be your hero academia. I was crying again, except, instead of tears of sadness, it was tears of joy. Finally, all that work was worth it. Now, I can become a hero. I thought happily. I went outside of my room by opening the door, and I said, Mom, I got in. She then proceeded to hug me tightly, with me enveloped in her. She gave the best hugs, giving me what I needed emotionally, even if she didn't know it. Thank you, Mom, for supporting me. After I had hugged her, I went to bed, remembering all the people that had fought for my place in the academy. It made me smile, even though I knew that not everyone would support or had supported me. I need to make everyone proud. I may be quirkless, but that won't stop me from becoming the strongest hero. Izuku POV I was getting ready for my first day at UA Academy, while my mom was making sure I had everything with me. I woke up early so I could prepare, and I made sure that my tie was correctly tied. My mom, instead of hugging me, complimented me on how I looked, and then pushed me out the door, then closing it after I was out of there. As I went to UA, I then remembered my first meeting with All Might. I remember that time when I insulted him on the beach, and how he turned that insult as a motivation to become a better hero. Maybe I went a bit too far. Then again, what would he have done if I hadn't said what I had? Three months ago, at the beach, I was running along the beach that I had cleaned up when I saw someone I didn't expect. Who is that? He has blonde hair, sullen eyes, and he slouches quite a bit. He doesn't remind me of anyone I know, but this beach isn't owned by me or my family, so he could be anyone. I was about to shrug it off. However, he then surprised me by saying my name as I passed him. Izuku Midoriya. I registered that about a second after passing him, my eyes widened in surprise, and it took ten seconds for me to stop. I was far enough from him that, if he was a powerful villain, I could prepare for his attack, but close enough that I would be able to hear what he is saying. Who is he? I ran at 60 miles per hour, and he didn't flinch. Granted, that isn't my top running speed, but that is faster than most cars are allowed to go. This guy might be serious. My arms tightened, and my brain was on overdrive. Time slowed down for me, and I suddenly had an awareness of everything that was happening. The gust of wind from the ocean, the rising and falling tides, the movement of sand across the beach. I became hyper-aware. Don't worry, I am not here to harm you, Izuku Midoriya. He said in a familiar voice. He seemed to know who I am and noticed my anxiety and how aware I was of what was happening, and tried to calm me down. Wait, that voice sounds like the voice of someone I have heard of. Let me start with the heroes that I know. 
It can't be Endeavor, Headshot, or Wash based on his appearance. It could be a shapeshifter, but from what I see, based on the color of his hair, his voice, and his demeanor, it could only be. No, that's impossible. Is it? I thought over five seconds after I checked my surroundings in the watch I had worn while jogging. Wait, are you all might? I said confused, suddenly jumping out of my hyper-aware state and lowering my guard. I realized that my assessment was right when his sullen eyes widened, and his mouth widened, but he realized that he looked terrified and calmed himself. He looked impressed, if a bit scared, and said, Huh, you're that smart. You can be able to tell who I am based on just two sentences and looking at me. Well, sort of. I consciously scratched the back of my head. When I passed you, a gust of wind blew across you from me running, and I saw the inside of your clothing. The size doesn't fit you, and the clothing has All Might's civilian name on the inside of them, so unless you somehow were able to steal All Might's clothing, which is unlikely, you are All Might. I lied. I looked into his shirt, but I didn't see the name on the inside of the shirt, and I didn't know whether I should tell him my full intellect and my full power, even if he is my idol. I scratched my head to make my lie more convincing. Oh, looks like that might be a problem when I am escaping from the press and fans. He said while laughing at his joke, before getting serious, you're right, I did mark it with my name. I am surprised you were able to catch it though. He now seemed relaxed after I told him my lie. A few seconds passed. Time then flowed naturally from my perspective. So, why did you defend me all might? I said, finally breaking the ice and asking the question that was on my mind for ages. Well, I saw something in you, as I said in the video. All Might's voice suddenly became soft. I saw someone who was like me. Someone who, regardless of how strong they were, and regardless of the situation, would be willing to put their life on the line for the sake of saving someone else. He saw himself in me. Wait, he said, regardless of how strong they were. Why would he say that? He said that I was like him. Does that mean he was quirkless, or was he just trying to be nice to me? It may be the latter, so let me ask a few more questions. But, was there any other reason that you vouched for me? He then sighed and looked at me sadly, like he was worried about what he would say next, and if he could trust me with a secret. I was quirkless, like you. I faced the same thing you did, only I didn't experience discrimination through schooling. I nodded for him to elaborate. I then saw him then look away from me, before saying, with despair and pain laced in his voice, I don't have a quirk, and I never did. I'll explain it later, but I can't tell you now. I don't know how people would react if they knew who I am. Wait, why? This would give so many people hope to become a hero. If the strongest hero is quirkless, this would mean that anyone can become a hero, quirkless or not. I said, slightly angry at why he would leave his quirk status a mystery. So many quirkless people commit suicide every day. Thousands of quirkless people die every week, with seemingly no limits, because many of them weren't allowed to learn how to defend themselves. If he revealed his the fact that the strongest hero has no quirk, and revealing what he isn't revealing to me, sure, his popularity might take a hit, but quirkless people will be treated better. Many people would be able to get jobs, regardless of their quirk, or lack thereof. People could achieve their dreams, and quirks wouldn't stand in the way. Well, I am not the hope for someone to become a hero. I didn't become this strong through a mundane exercise. I didn't do 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups, and 100 squats, and a 10 kilometers run every day for 3 years to become this strong without a quirk. I made sure that my exercise routine couldn't be followed by anyone because I can't be a hero if I would depend on others. I am the hope that there is one person is out there who will save people and bring justice to the wicked. Well, then you are a crappy hero then, I say, making me stop with trying to speak to him as someone I idolize. I realized that he needed to change, and I, through my words, needed to show that to him. Excuse me. All Might then shifted to his more powerful form. He towered over me, with his muscles capable of destroying a building. I didn't flinch. I looked up towards him and said, putting so much on yourself means that you are the breaking point of all of Japan. A strong one, but a breaking point nonetheless. What would happen if you couldn't save everyone, or when you faced someone who could beat you? What then, huh? The entirety of Japan, no, the world, would be wiped out if you weren't around because you can't inspire people to defend themselves. I said, trying to make my words tower over him, forcing him to listen. I need to speak my mind to him, otherwise, the world around us would face certain doom if he couldn't save it. Since he is a person of power, he could make sure that the world would be safe without him. If only I can convince him. He sighed again before shifting to his less powerful form and looked downwards while saying, You are right. I know that. I know I have to change, but I know that some people can't defend themselves, while I can defend everyone. I still didn't stop my harsh attitude, and I still needed to convince him to do what I say. Well, look at me. I am quirkless, and yet I got a higher score than you when you went to UA. I wasn't a huge outlier. I was average four-year-old, who tried their hardest to become strong, learning martial arts, how to control myself, and everything else that I needed to learn. I took in a breath, which I also used to collect my thoughts and to let the words that I said sink in before saying, yes, not everyone has the drive to become a hero. However, that doesn't mean that you can shun the people who do and prevent the fighting and heroic spirit that is common in true heroes. Regardless of their powers, or their background, people, with dedication and determination, people can achieve anything. I clasped my hands together while saying, you need to inspire that determination. 
anyone and everyone, I said while spreading my arms out wide, representing the people around the world, can have the drive to work hard if they can be inspired. You need to make sure that people will work hard and learn how to defend themselves. Otherwise, when you die, either through old age or through a battle, I said while imagining the destroyed world, Japan and the world will be in ruins. He then smiled sadly, showing a man whose entire life had just been put into question by me. Huh, I can't believe I am saying this, but you're right. He sighed sadly. Seriously, you are right. I need to become an inspiring hero. He then started to chuckle, but somberly, not the warm and joyous laugh that I had heard. You are only 14, and yet, I feel as if you are already a better hero than I am at my 40s. You are a true hero. He then proceeded to sit down on the beach in front of me and look saddened, like he was contemplating his death and the pressure he had put on himself. I then felt a little guilty at what I had done. Come on, maybe the criticism was warranted, but not at this time, and not to the person who got you into the school of your dreams. I mentally scolded myself. All might, I am. Don't be, All Might said, interrupting my apology, before sounding inspired, you have said exactly what I needed to hear. I need to become an inspiring hero for all those that live, and I need to become a better hero before I die. Wait, die. He can't be dying, can he? I suddenly became worried before All Might silenced me by raising his hand in his deflated form. Five years ago, a strong enemy did this to me. He then proceeded to lift his shirt. I saw his chest, which didn't look defined and tough like I imagined it to be, but it looked rather bruised, and his side had a gash in it from the outside, outlined in his skin. My respiratory system was nearly destroyed, and my stomach was removed, and I have wasted away because of the after-effects of the surgeries. I can now only do hero work for three hours each day. Wait, five years ago. My eyes widened as I remembered what happened that year. When you fought Toxic Chainsaw five years ago, he did this to you. One, good job, you did your homework on me, and two, no, that lowlife could never be able to defeat me. He then proceeded to stand up. When he stood up, he said, this was never made public. That is, I asked that it not be made public. The symbol of peace who saves people with a smile must never be daunted by evil. He then looked away from me, and looked at the buildings near the beach, saying, the reason I smile is to stave off the overwhelming pressure I feel. A pro should always be ready to risk his life. He then turned towards my direction but didn't look me in the eye as if he was afraid. Like you did. You risked your life to save that girl, even though you didn't know her. That is true heroism. But you knew what you were getting yourself into, and you knew yourself into. Unlike me, who just rushed in without a plan against a much stronger enemy and acted recklessly. He then looked me in the eyes, full of determination, and said, Young Midoriya, you can become a hero. You will become a better hero than I ever was, and I will make sure that I will act as the hero the world needs me to be until my time comes to an end. Ever since then, he put careful attention in making sure that he could encourage people, regardless of their powers, to become heroes. Even though he was entrusted to be the symbol of peace, he still wanted to make sure that people would be able to defend themselves by encouraging them to take a stand and to save people without him around. Some people asked why he started to do this, while some said that All Might was trying to make the people around him safer. While his sudden actions did increase his positive popularity, even more than it already was, it had little positive effects on the actual crime rate. However, it did reduce the number of people who had died every day as more people had come to martial arts studio, including Master Bang's studio, to learn how to defend themselves. From what Master Bang had said about the students, who were mostly quirkless people, it seems people like me won't be known as the weaklings for much longer. While All Might's change wouldn't drastically reduce suicide rates from quirkless people instantly, it would encourage the quirkless people who haven't given up on life yet to become heroes. It would also make a better infrastructure when he lost his quirk, and when Endeavor would be the number one hero. Plus, this means that discrimination, while it will still exist, won't be socially accepted, because I won't be the only strong quirkless person who has gotten into UA. That is a big deal for the world and people like me. I thought as I went inside the massive school, with the words UA plastered on the entrance of the school. I took my time to soak in what I was doing here. This is not a dream, and, thanks to the support of the students who saw me, and All Might, I am now able to become a hero. Sure, I had a plan to become a hero without UA, but, this was my original plan, and I am glad that I am keeping it. I smiled as I went into the building, where I had to find my classroom, hoping that I wasn't late. Now, I have to find my classroom. 1A, 1A, 1A. I then stood in front of the door of my classroom, which had a sign on the top of it that said 1A on it. The door was about twice my height, and about three times as wide. However, I wasn't intimidated but inspired to open the door to my classroom. I hope I can get the chance to apologize to some of the people who stood up for me. I thought as I opened the door. Then, I opened the door and found Katsuki putting his feet on the desk, while another student was lecturing him. Remove your foot from that desk. The other student said, Such an action is insulting to those who came to Yua before us as well as the craftsmen who made this desk. The student looked familiar, but I couldn't place where I met him. Wait, he was one of the people who stood up for me on the exam to present Mike. I should apologize to him. I thought, but, for some reason, I wanted to see how Katsuki would react, so I stood where I was. Like I care. What middle school did you come from, you extra? He said rather harshly. The student, stunned, said, I am from Summy Private Academy. 
My name is Tenya Ida. Oh, so that's why he was unfamiliar with rude people not listening to him. He must be shielded from people like Bakugu. Then it hit me. Wait, Ida, like Tensei Ida, the hero in Genium. So that's why he looked familiar. He looks very similar to his brother, excluding the glasses. I thought while analyzing Tenya, Summy, he said with an evil grin, a stuck-up elitist then, I should blow you to bits. You're awful. Do you wish to become a hero? He said, with a hint of disgust in his voice. I chuckled. You should know by now to never judge someone based on where they are from or what group they are a part of, but based on their actions and who they are. I realized I said that out loud, and, surprisingly, Katsuki didn't try to kill me. Instead, he scoffed and put his feet down on the floor. I was surprised, to say the least, but everyone else was even more surprised by my words and how I could make Bakugou listen to me. Wow, so manly. I heard a guy whisper. I saw the source of the sound, which appeared to be a guy with red hair sticking out of his head. He looks a little plain looking. I heard a girl whisper this time. She had green hair and a froggy smile plastered over her face. I can hear you damn it, Katsuki said, shutting up everyone's conversation. Ah, Midoriya. I heard a girl's voice again, only this time, it was much more familiar. I turned around, only to see Achako Yuraka in a school uniform. We became friends, but I had forgotten to ask her phone number so I couldn't talk to her. She looks pretty cute in the school uniform. I can see that her chest looks big and... Wait, now I am thinking like some sort of pervert. Ugggghhh, damn me. I scolded myself again for feeling this way. You got into UA, just like All Might said. Makes sense though. You saved my life with that epic punch of yours. She said while punching the air, making me slightly chuckle. After she stopped talking, I collected myself, ridding my mind of the perverted thoughts present in it, and said, Yeah, I probably wouldn't have gotten into the school without your, Edis, and the other exam takers' help. They might not have let me in if it weren't for you guys. So thank you, Achako. I turned around to Ida and to the other people who stood up for me, and thank you, Tenya, and everyone who helped me get in. I wouldn't have been able to get in without you guys and All Might. Everyone was stunned by how humble I acted, but what they were more surprised was that All Might had supported me. The people who weren't in the same environment as I had their jaws to the desk. But, before I could be asked any questions by the students, I heard someone behind me calmly say, If you're here to socialize, then get out. I turned around, along with Ochako, and saw a man inside a caterpillar-like sleeping bag. He looked as if he hadn't slept for days. He then proceeded to suck on a juice pouch, while saying, This is the hero course. I, along with Ochako, proceeded to back up so that the person in the caterpillar sleeping bag could walk into the classroom. It took eight seconds for you to quiet down. He said while standing up, out of his sleeping bag. Time is a precious resource. You lot aren't very rational, are you? Wait, that look, his tired attitude, his talk of rationality, that reminds me of a hero. But who? I thought of the less known heroes. I'm your homeroom teacher, Shoto Aizawa. Pleased to meet you. He said, homeroom teacher. Wait, Shoto Aizawa. That name sounds familiar. Wait, is he a racer head? He isn't a very well-known hero, kind of like a real-life ninja. The only thing that people know about him is that he exists. Well, looking at him, with his tired attitude and his dry eyes, he looks to have a quirk that requires him to have his eyes wide open for a long time, so it is probably an emitter-type quirk. However, he probably wouldn't be complaining if he was able to fix it, with the first thing he said to us, so that means that traditional dry eye solutions won't be effective for him. Maybe I should invent something. Quickly now, he said as he thrust some kind of uniform into my face, interrupting my thoughts. Change into your gym clothes and head to the grounds. We all changed into the gym uniforms, then left us to move to the grounds, as our homeroom teacher asked us to do. As we edged closer to the grounds, I started thinking. What is he going to do? We are skipping the ceremony and guidance counselor sessions, and we are going outside when everyone else is staying inside for the UA events. However, this guy, he is serious. He doesn't mess around, so I have to make sure I come in prepared. I started engaging adrenaline inside me, trying to give myself that extra edge that I thought I might need. Then, we approached the grounds, and we saw our teacher, bored as hell, who waited for us. So, we are going to test your quirks now, so don't take so much time to come here. He said, seemingly aggravated by how long we took, even though we came as quickly as we could. What about the entrance exam, or guidance sessions? Hachako voiced out her thoughts as she stopped near our teacher. No time to waste on that stuff if you want to become heroes. He said lazily as he dragged his body across the field. UA is known for its freestyle education system. He explained, that applies to us teachers as well. I realized what he was going to do. Wait, he is going to be testing our physical skills, right? Because that is the only reason he would have to come out here. I also remember, when researching this school, that there is one teacher who is responsible for expelling 18 students when he felt they had no potential. This has to be that teacher. Wait, is he going to test us using the gym tests in middle school, just with quirks instead? That makes sense since those tests encompass most physical activity. He then started listing the middle school tests, like softball throwing, side-to-side -side jumps, etc., and then said, this country still insists on prohibiting quirks when calculating the average of those records. It's not rational. The Department of Education system is just procrastinating. I disagree, I said, shocking everyone around me, including my teacher. 
He turned around with a face that made him look with hatred. I felt everyone's eyes burn into my skull, and I knew that I was going to be questioned about me suddenly ruining the atmosphere. Even Bakugu, who was well known for causing this kind of commotion, looked at me like I punched him and just walked away. Huh, maybe that's where I got the blunt personality from. Well, I know I can be blunt, but I need to in certain circumstances. Dude, we know that you are manly, but you can't just. No, tell me, what did you want to say? Because we are all listening now. The teacher suddenly focused on me, as if he was waiting for me to slip up. Not that I did. Well, what if they, say, faced a person capable of erasing quirks, eraser head. I said cunningly, after figuring out his quirk and identity. He suddenly walked back with downright shock. He looked downright terrified that I knew his identity. How? How did you know? I shrug. You give off too much of yourself away, Mr. Aizawa. You give a tired look, despite not doing a lot of physical exercises, and I can see that you aren't the kind of person to complain without a reason. You also follow a lot of ninja technique. You seem to sleep on your left side, which protects your heart the most, which is common ninja, or should I say shinobi practice. You also use the element of surprise to see how prepared we were, and you wear black, which, with modern lighting, would be great with hiding. While not much is known about Eraserhead, he is known to take a lot from shinobi techniques for his fights. Everyone looked stunned with my assessment, but I wasn't finished with what I was saying. But, back to what I was saying, quirks aren't everything. As I said, if they face someone capable of removing quirks, they need to be able to defeat them without one. You need to develop your body with your quirk, sure, but you need to develop your body separately from it as well, otherwise, you will be your quirk, not the other way around. Is that so? Eraser had said with an evil grin on his face. Then, you will have to do all the tests twice without your quirk, and I will take your lowest score. If you are lower than in first place in every event, then you will be expelled. Everyone looked stunned by his statement, but I was unfazed. Okay, so when can I start? I say confidently. Everyone looked incredulous at me and my calm attitude. Now, actually, he said, unfazed by my attitude. It was as if he knew I would fail. What was your score? A uh, half a kilometer. 508.5 meters to be exact. Everyone had their jaws to the ground as if they expected a lower score. Now try again, with your maximum strength. He said, hearing no sympathy come from his voice. He wants me to go all out, huh? Well, might as well try. I tightened my muscles, concentrated some of my strength into my right arm, and threw it as high as I could. I have to set an example. If I am going to be a hero, that means being able to speak my mind and be able to change people. Some people need only words, while some need actions. I need to show that I am not just talking. I put my fingers on the center of the ball, gripping it with my fingers. I felt the wind blowing in my face, the grass being blown around, and my face became serious, and I said, right before throwing, referencing an old hero I admired. Killer move serious series, serious punch. I made the ball accelerate to the speed of sound in one second. I threw it with enough force to send the ball to another continent at the speed of sound, but I contained the force in front of me and to the surrounding air to prevent casualties and to prevent the entire building behind me from collapsing. However, when I turned around, I realized it wasn't enough. Everyone had been thrown back towards the building, and many of the windows had cracked. The sonic boom that had been created pushed everyone back. I heard some ringing from my ears from the sonic boom that I had created, but I knew that I hadn't incurred serious injuries, and I knew I could still be able to do the other activities. Hey, you guys okay? I asked, genuinely concerned about everyone. Yeah, we're fine. Mr. Aizawa, how far did Izuku throw? Achako said while getting off the dirt and grass off her uniform. Well, he threw it to America. I island, to be specific. He said calmly. He showed me the counter, which said 8,803,112 meters or 8,803.112 kilometers, which was about 5470 miles eastward. He showed it to the rest of the students. What the hell? All the students said. Meanwhile, Melissa POV. I was walking around the island after school had ended that day as I took in the beauty of spring. I walked alone, as I did most days after school had ended today. Wow, so many things are in bloom during the spring. Plants, trees, I sneezed, interrupting my thoughts. Allergies. I wonder if I will be able to find any new plants to study or things to find. Then, as if the heavens above had heard me, I saw an object in the air. I couldn't make out what it was, but I could tell that it was coming to my location quickly. I observed it as it fell, and the object fell several feet away from me, creating a crater in the ground. I was curious, so I approached the fallen object cautiously. Then, I saw the crater, which was about four inches wide and half a food foot deep. Wait, a soft ball. I picked up the object within the crater with gloves that I had on me, carefully handling the ball, making sure no evidence could be tampered with or changed. Wait, that's no ordinary softball. That's the softball that is used for gym tests in Japan, according to Uncle Might. How can a softball be thrown this far out, even with a quirk? From the hole created alone, it must have been propelled for thousands of miles to gain this much momentum, but by what, or by who? I then decided to find out. I carefully brought the softball back to my lab to investigate, placing it in. While fingerprints aren't the most accurate way to find someone's identity, it is the fastest test that I can do here, so I will have to do it. 
I then started the machine as it collected the data. Well, there seem to be two fingerprints on here, but it is hard to say whose fingerprint it belongs to since one of the fingerprints are on a worn out portion of the softball. However, the metallic sender does have a fingerprint. Let me search for students in Japan since that is supposedly where this ball is coming from. I used the database that Japan had publicly available on school kids and searched for a match. A match came up almost immediately on my over $7,000 scientific PC by Compulub. Izuku Midoriya. Status, quirkless. Wait, he's like me. If he can propel this softball over 5,000 miles, then he might be as strong as Uncle Might. Maybe even stronger, and that's without a quirk. So that's who Uncle Might was talking about. I relaxed, knowing who had thrown it, and solving who my uncle was talking about. Wait, if he is quirkless, then how can he have thrown it that far? While people like Saitama and Garu have been as strong in the past, they were always just outliers. Wait, what if Izuku was someone like them, and he wants to challenge the supposedly common knowledge that quirkless people can't be strong? Maybe I should help him during his journey to becoming a hero. I started to grin, thinking of how I could help him, and planning my trip to UA, as well as thinking how to convince my dad to let me travel there. After all, Izuku Midoriya might just be the strongest H-E-R-O-W-O-A-H. How could you throw it that far? That was amazing. Do you really have no quirk? Everyone started crowding around me except Katsuki, who looked pissed, Achako, who seemed to be jealous, and the other students who took the exam in the same testing location as I did, who weren't surprised in the slightest. Amazing, you say, Aizawa said, interrupting everyone. You're hoping to become heroes after three years here, and you think it'll be all fun and games. He said menacingly while creating a dark aura around himself. The one with the lowest score across all events will be judged hopeless, he paused, and will be expelled. Your fate is now in your hands, he said as he lifted his hair, revealing his sadistic-looking eyes. Welcome, this is the hero course of UA High. The lowest scorer will be expelled, Achako said urgently, along with Izuku, if he gets lower than a first place. That's unfair, for both Izuku and the rest of us. Hey, guys, he may be serious about expelling us, but he isn't wrong. Everyone now seemed confused by me defending Aizawa's actions, especially considering that he might expel me if I don't beat everyone. Murderers, fake heroes who only care about their bottom line, and villains emerging left and right. The world is an unfair and cruel place. So, if we want to become true heroes, we have to overcome any obstacles and become the best. Yes, he will expel the last place if he doesn't see any potential in them, and me if I don't get first place. But, that means that we all have to work hard to overcome these challenges. We have to go beyond. I raise my fist into the air. Plus Ultra. Everyone raises their first along with me, even Katsuki. Mr. Aizawa led us to the 50-meter race. After a few races had gone by, and, then, I had to race against Achako. Good luck, Izuku. She said, with her signature grin that I was still having a hard time understanding. How can she be so happy? I say, slightly getting lost in her smile, before snapping out of it. Good luck to you. I saw her lower her hands to her feet, almost touching her toes. My advice would be to lighten your lower body, so you will be able to go longer unless you can't sustain it. But, if you can hold it for a few seconds, you can go significantly faster than if you just lighten your feet. Her eyes looked like she was thinking, why didn't I think of that? And she moved her hands to her legs and activated her quirk as she was preparing herself. Go, faster than most people blinked, I ran and completed the race in just over a second. 1.05 seconds to be precise. It took a second for most people to process what just happened. That's my fastest time yet. I had to have run at 48 meters per second, or 107 miles per hour to complete it that quickly. Well, since that was not difficult for me, I have to make sure that I don't push myself now unless I have to, otherwise, I don't even know what people would think of me. Then, Achako finished the race about 4 seconds afterward. Wow, that's my fastest time yet. Thanks, Izuku. She said, only a few inches away from kissing me. Wait, why am I thinking about her kissing me? Ugh, damn me. I mentally facepalm myself. Uh, no problem. I consciously scratched the back of my head, trying and failing to remove the thoughts from my head. How did you know that would work though? She said while walking outside of the track. Well, for my training, I had to read a lot of literature, I said, then dropping the perverted thoughts I had for much. Better and more rational thoughts. Some were for me to be able to learn about more ancient types of literature, but the other books I had to read were about exercise routines and human weight distribution, mainly to have a balanced, strong body, and how to use energy more efficiently. I clarified my thought process, but when I looked at her, her face still looked curious. It seemed that I hadn't explained the question fully. One time, I read a book called Human Body Dynamics, Classical Mechanics and Human Movement. Really exciting name, I know, and it said that the lower human body takes about 32% of a human weight. Now, while that may depend whether you're a male or female, it would still take a massive amount of weight off of you if you applied zero gravity to your lower body. I turned around and saw her blushing slightly. That came out wrong, didn't it? She slowly nodded. I sighed, then sincerely said, I'm sorry for commenting on your weight. I didn't mean it like that. Oh, no, it's fine. She shook her head. It was a little blunt, though. I'm sorry, again, I said, still sincerely apologizing. No, it's fine. She started to smile again. 
though he is still her smart with or without books. You were able to deduce who our teacher was from only looking at him in a few sentences, even though no one else knows who he is. That's amazing, Achako said, again, ever so close to my face, bringing back the somewhat perverted thoughts I had. But, before Achako or I could say anything else, I had been called by Mr. Aizawa to go again against Katsuki. He came to the starting line and readied himself. When I looked at him, he had a smug smile on his face as if he already had a plan to beat me, and I wouldn't be able to stop him. He's probably going to use his explosions to distract or blind me, so I probably should close my eyes and run. I also have to make sure I run before he even reacts and before tries to blind me. So, I looked at everything, registering it in my brain, then, I closed my eyes and waited for the signal. Go. I ran and before Katsuki could react, I had already passed the finish line by the time he started, based on me hearing his explosions about 100 milliseconds after I had stopped. I stopped when I heard my time, then looked around, revealing my eyes to the shocked faces of the students as they heard it as well. 0.5 seconds. I walked away, turning around to go to the next event, trying to seem like I didn't care about the score. Wait, isn't that effectively 100 meters per second, or 224 miles per hour? A girl said, stopping me by putting her arm on my shoulder. I didn't turn around, even as she spoke. How is it possible that you would be able to outpace everyone, despite having no quirk? Because I wanted to, I said, trying to be vague about my strength level so everyone wouldn't end up fearing me. Wanted to do what? She said, looking rather confused while inching closer to me. I felt her body heat, and I turned around, seeing the girl who had grabbed me. She had black hair and a spiky ponytail, and she had black eyes that tried to burrow into me, but with my stoic face, she couldn't get any information out of me. I know she is partially trying to intimidate me, but it doesn't look very intimidating. It is making her look cute. I face by myself. Seriously, what the hell is wrong with me? I am going to become a hero. I am not a pervert. I try to keep a stoic face and try to stop myself from blushing, as I say, because I want to be the number one hero. Why else would I be here for? I bring up more confidence, as she backed up, possibly in fear, but perhaps in awe, as others had done around me. I stood up straight and said, if I couldn't be able to pass the tests with flying colors and be the number one in these tests, then I don't belong here. No one belongs here if they don't have the drive to become a hero. But mark my words, I pointed to all of the people in front of me. I am going to be the number one hero, and nothing and no one will stop me. I turn around, leaving them with my words, and left to go to the next event. If you guys don't have the determination to become the best, then you are wasting your time here. You have to push yourself to the limits as I did, otherwise, you guys won't get anywhere. I went to the grip strength event next. Before me, I saw others. The highest score, before I had gotten there, was the force of 540 kilograms, or just under 12 pounds of force. That's the highest score. Let me see if I can top that. I smiled, thinking of my training, and being able to lift cars in the air and throw them several feet away. So, I think, for my first turn, I should strive to get a higher score than anyone else could achieve, then, in the second one, undercut myself again by a slight margin. So, I set up myself with the monitor. I have to make sure that I am holding back. However, I need to make sure that no one can say that I am cheating, so I need to beat them by a significant margin. I wrapped my fingers around the machine, trying to set a baseline score that would beat everyone. I then heard the machine beep, and I looked at the score. 1,000 kilograms of force, or just over 22 pounds of force was shown on the reader. Everyone crowded around me after hearing my beep on the reader. I had reset the monitor and put it back in my hand, but not before people had seen the score. What? What are you? A monster. You managed to beat everyone not once, but twice. You must have a lot of determination to push yourself to that degree where you could so easily do that. The black-haired girl said, cutting through other people's conversations. She walked towards me, as people said. Easily. That was easy for him. Yes, clearly it was. All of these tests seemed to be easy for him. Running at a quarter of the speed of sound, pressing the force of a car on his fingertips, throwing a ball to another continent. This isn't even the strongest you can do, is it? She said, slightly intimidating me. Damn it. Never mind. She can be plenty intimidating when she wants to. Then I ended up accidentally breaking the monitor in fear. When everyone noticed it, they backed away. Uh, Mr. Aizawa. I say as I approached him, seeing as how everyone created a pathway for me when I was going towards him. Hem, he said, his eyes half-lidded as he looked at me. I, uh, broke the machine. I think I pressed on it too hard. I say while scratching my head. No matter, he said, showing me a non-sadistic smile, surprising everyone. He almost looked proud, but with the slight tinge of annoyance, probably from me breaking it. You can just go to the next event. What was the maximum grip strength of the machine, though? I said while whispering, afraid of who could be hearing me. He then put on a serious face while whispering in my ear, 25,000 kilograms of force. I mentally facepalmed myself, mostly because I got scared for no reason. Ugh, this was a complete accident. 
I wanted to make sure that I wouldn't overexert myself. I didn't overexert myself this time, but I came damn close. I need to be more careful next time, otherwise, I will be treated the same way Saitama was. I went to the next event, not fully registering what was happening during that event, or the event after that, but, what I did know was that I still got the highest score in the long jump and the side-to-side -side jumps. I wasn't sure why I didn't register what was happening, or why my mind blocked those memories, but I concluded that my brain was on autopilot, so I wouldn't react to fear. I snapped out of autopilot as soon as we came back to the throwing the softball. Yuraka threw it, which got her the score of infinity. Infinity, wow, the infinity symbol actually popped up. Then, I started to get a little worried about being expelled, as I have never gotten a score of infinity. But, regardless, I went to throw the softball again, stepping up, both literally and figuratively, to the plate. As I said, if you don't beat or tie first place, then you will be expelled, along with the last place. Mr. Aizawa said. I sighed. How can I possibly get infinity meters? Yes, I understand. Now, guys, I say while looking away, trying to keep the swirling emotions inside of me from being seen on my face. You should probably back up. Otherwise, you might get hurt. I also suggest putting these on. I say, turning around to give ear protection to the students. I had enough for 20 people, so I gave it to everyone. Oh fuck no, Katsuki said, using his quirk to burn the pair of earbuds that I was giving to him to ashes. No way, I don't need your fucking help. Okay, suit yourself. I say calmly, walking away from an emotional Katsuki. These were supposed to be earbuds that I could use to protect my ears as well as learn information from the news, in case I would have to save anyone. Right now though, it's purely for ear protection. I have to get serious, and I need to push myself. However, if I don't get a first or second place now, then all of my work and time won't matter. I looked around me, where all the students had protective gear on that would protect their ears from the explosion, but it would still make sure that the people wearing them would still be able to communicate with each other. Some whispered, if Midoriya loses this, then he will be expelled. That's not fair for him. And he was doing so well. Deku deserves to be expelled from this school, the quirkless bastard that he is. Everyone looked at Katsuki when he said that, looking rather angry at him, but he scoffed. Hey, guys, don't worry, I say, oozing fake confidence while looking at them, surprising everyone except the black-haired girl. Looks like I will have to put my money where my mouth is. So, I looked away. Well, how can anyone throw at infinity meters? Black holes have infinite density, but that just means they don't know the exact density, and no human can comprehend it. So, they are saying, as long as it can't transmit the location back, then it is infinity. Then I mentally slap myself. Of course, they would think of that. I can't outsmart it now since I can't throw it into a black hole. Also, if I throw it into space, who knows what it will hit. A meteor, a satellite. So, no throwing it into space. What I can do is throw it with my maximum strength. But, if I throw it with my full strength and with my full body, then I wouldn't be able to do the other tests. How about concentrating some of my strength in my arm again? But, to make sure no excess energy gets wasted going past the atmosphere, I have to angle it low, less than 1 degree. Probably around 1 40th of a degree at 1 million meters per second at around 165 centimeters above the ground. I set myself up to throw the softball. I made sure that, even though I will use all of my strength, I would contain it to my arm instead of the surrounding area. I threw it at 1 40th of a degree upwards and, again, a supersonic shockwave was created. Unlike last time, however, I threw it so hard that it wasn't even visible after I threw it, and I heard and felt my throwing arm's bones crack, while blood seeped out of me. I tried to contain the force of the ball to my arm and chest, and, for the force I couldn't contain, I made sure it was spread into the atmosphere. However, again, I wasn't able to contain the full force, and I felt a significant amount of force go behind me. Even though the people behind me tried to prepare for it, they were still thrown blown back to the building, and this time, I heard the windows of the building shatter from the sonic boom. My earbuds kept my ears from bursting, but I still felt some ringing in my eardrums. What the hell? Everyone said. When I turned around, I saw that everyone except for the black-haired girl looked dazed. I didn't hear the beep from the monitor, which was supposed to indicate that it had stopped. Wait, the ball hasn't landed yet. I ask. Mr. Aizawa shook his head, then looked at me. No, it hasn't. Not yet. So we waited in anticipation as more blood started to seep out of my wounds. Everyone was talking among themselves, wondering where it went, while some were confused about how I was still standing. About half a minute passed before Achako said, Wait, what's that? While pointing towards the sky, a rounded object was hurled across the sky, looking to be burning a purple color. It rushed past the horizon line, disappearing. Another 30 seconds afterward, it came again, still burning a bright purple. Wait, if it is burning the color purple, that means that it must be hotter than plasma. That means that that is hotter than the surface of our sun. How is it possible that it hasn't disappeared by burning through the atmosphere? If you are wondering how it hasn't disappeared yet due to atmospheric burning, the black-haired girl said, grabbing my attention as I turned around. She stood up, as well as grabbing the attention of many other students, that is because it isn't made with ordinary fabric, like cottons, or metals, like iron or steel. 
The fabric is made up of a combination of graphene and tungsten, which, while not 100% efficient in creating the most lightweight and strong materials, makes a fabric that it can survive plasma temperatures for short periods of time, and makes it aerodynamic enough so the ball won't be slowed down by atmospheric friction. I stare at her, confused. Not because I didn't know what she was talking about, but because I knew exactly what she was talking about. Wait, how did you know how what it was made of? I ask, slightly stunned by her knowledge of materials. Oh, she said, covering her face as if she were blushing in embarrassment, while also looking away from me. Well, my father and mother have patents for several different common technologies and have sold it to many different manufacturers. I also contributed to some of them. In the time when I was curious, I read quite a bit about materials and alloys, especially in commercial use. I suggested to my parents my design for the softball, and they got it implemented across Japan, including UA. Wait, you, at less than 14, were able to make patents that influenced all of Japan. I said, sounding like the curious kid I once was while hiding and ignoring the pain in my right arm. That's amazing. She then started blushing more, but she nodded while looking slightly proud of herself at me. Yeah, I guess it is. I then start to activate my nerdy brain, lowering my guard for a second, and still not registering the blood coming out of my arm. But, why graphene instead of crystalline structures? If you used, say, diamonds, sure, it would cost more, but you would only use one material instead of two, and the melting point of diamonds is even higher than that of tungsten, and diamonds are much more commercially viable to get into a fabric. Throw tungsten in, or graphene combined with diamond fabric, and you could get a much more durable material against plasma. She had her hand under her chin as if she hadn't thought of that before. I haven't thought of that before. I don't know why. But, as she was about to say more, everyone became quiet. The monitor beeped. 89,270,312 meters is what the monitor said as Mr. Aizawa showed it to us. Wait, that's more than 55,470 miles, which means that the ball circled the Earth twice. That's the second highest score for this test. I was slightly crestfallen after learning my score, but I still stood tall after seeing my score, because, even though I knew that I had lost, I also knew that I was able to achieve some of my goals. I beat nearly everyone. Even if I will be expelled, at least I know that all of my work wasn't wasted. I know that, now, all the work and training I did wasn't for nothing. I slightly smiled to myself while turned the other way, enjoying the bittersweet moment. Then someone interrupted my thoughts. You've been able to throw a softball across the earth two times without a quirk. The black-haired girl said, looking at me in awe instead of the fear I usually saw on people's faces. Who are you? Me, I say, pointing at myself with my non-broken arm. I felt the atmosphere shift, and I saw everyone look at me. My name is Izuku Midoriya, and I am going to become the strongest hero. Melissa POV. I had all my things packed, and I had gotten myself ready for the only plane ticket that was going out of I island. I heard other people discuss my departure, and how many people were surprised by my decision to move to Japan, at least the people who were awake. However, I ignored them. Well, I was able to convince Dad to let me go alone to Japan. Then again, if it weren't for Izuku, then my father wouldn't have let me go. I became slightly embarrassed when I remembered the conditions for me moving to Japan for the rest of high school. Though, I didn't expect to be living with a younger guy. 6 p.m. on my island. I had packed up my clothes, laptop, and other things that I needed for transferring schools. Now, I just have to convince my dad. I sighed, dreading my confrontation with my father as I finished up packing. That is probably going to be the hardest thing to do. I walked within the building as I saw the beauty of the island at night. The lights that glowed, the grass that sways with the wind, and the sight of the ocean just outside the island. After a few seconds, I left to go to my father's office. He, along with many other scientists, did their work in an elaborate building with a nearly foolproof security system, which kept the scientists in their safe, but, like them being stuck on this island, they were trapped inside that building. I walked past the security systems and into my dad's office, which was structured differently compared to his lab. I walked into my dad's office, and I knocked lightly on the metal door, waiting to go in. The voice behind the door responded by saying, come in. As soon as he saw me as I closed the door behind me, he looked confused. Wait, Melissa, what are you doing here? You have school in a few hours. I turned towards him, remembering all the things I needed to say. That's actually what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to ask you something about transferring schools. Can we go on the porch to talk about this? He again looked confused by my request, but he reluctantly nodded and went to the porch, along with me, to talk. I then tell him of my intention to transfer to UA to help Izuku Midoriya. However, before I could tell him about the fact that Izuku was quirkless, he said, absolutely not. Those were the first words that came out of his mouth as I suggested my transfer to UA. Why not, father? I ask, trying to appeal to them. He is a person who has the potential to break all barriers and become a great hero, maybe even greater than All Might. Yes, maybe he has the potential to become a hero, as he was the first quirkless person to get into UA. So, looked like he had the news about him as well. Izuku's work and dedication have already reached so many people. I smiled lightly. However, he looked rather serious, which made me discard my smile. You aren't able to leave. If someone kidnapped you, they could end up using you as a ransom. You could be injured, killed even, for the information for the island. 
not to mention the risks of you going outside the island. The entire island's security could be compromised. I say in equal seriousness, well, Izuku Midoriya is worth that risk. He sighed as if he wanted to avoid this topic altogether. Is this about a crush or infatuation you have for him? Wait, what? I waved my hands in front of me to conceal my face. No, as if I could have a crush on a guy that is younger than me. But, this is partially for his sake. I wonder how he has held up for so long as someone quirkless. Wonder if he has felt the same things I have. Then why would you suggest transferring to another school in another country for one guy? He says calmly after he teased me. I calm myself as well after thinking, and say, you have heard of his achievement of being the first quirkless person to get into UA. He is a lot like me in that regard. I say, connecting it to myself. I know that he probably feels lonely. Everyone is at his throat and even the people who aren't waiting for him to make a mistake have no idea what he is feeling. He must be very lonely. After I cleared that thought out of my head, I said, with conviction, but, what you may not know is that Izuku is the person who also beat All Might's record of 100 with a score of 140. He was also able to throw a softball from Japan to I Island without even giving it his all. I had found it. He suddenly discarded what he was going to say, in favor of a confused look. Wait, what? I then show him the softball, which had a few burn marks and dirt splashed across its surface, but otherwise, it was a clean softball. I had put on gloves before bringing it to show him. I found his fingerprint on it, and he was in school in Japan when I had found this. So unless he touched it to give it to something else, he had to be the person who had thrown it. He carefully handled it, carrying it with his fingertips on the bottom of the softball. Like me, he also had put on some gloves. He slightly leaned forward, looking a few years older with stress. Where did you find this? He looked on edge, not knowing what to expect. I found it out on the inside of the wall. It had been buried in several feet of dirt by the time I saw it fall onto the ground. He looked at me. Even if he did throw it this far, who is he? As a person. He straightened his back, as he said, can you answer that for me? I looked downwards. Well, no. Then I look up with a surprising amount of fire in my eyes. But, with his strength, and him being the only quirkless person to get into UA, he is as strong as All Might right now, at the age of 14. He has more potential than any other person with a quirk. My dad looked to be about to disregard what I had to say until he saw something. Wait, what's? My dad pointed to the object headed towards us. That, to prove my point, a smoking ball had approached us. I pushed my dad and me out of the way of the ball's trajectory. The ball broke through the door and smoked in my father's office. He looked at me, and asked again. What is that? A ball. The softballs that are used for Japanese tests. I quickly get up, and I helped my dad get up. My dad sensed my curiosity of what that was, and, more importantly, who threw that, so he said, wait, be careful. I'll get it. He opened the now broken door and picked up the ball with some gloves he had in his jacket. Let me carry it to my lab, so I can see who threw it. Stay here. He said, almost in a commanding way. I had rarely seen that side of my dad, so, when he did use that voice, I almost always listened to him. Okay, dad, I say. I'll wait here. He then quickly left to his lab. Fifteen minutes had passed before he came in with the softball, looking to be out of breath, but now, he looked unsure, but one emotion I saw conveyed in his eyes was belief. I found Izuku's blood here, on the softball. Wait, blood. Did he push himself to throw it that far? I saw what the ball looked like, because the ball he was carrying was far more destroyed compared to the ball I had found. He sighed as if he knew that I was right. Okay, you can transfer schools to help Izuku grow as a hero, but I will have to make you live with someone. Shouldn't I stay in a hotel? No, staying with someone would give you the most protection against harm, especially since we don't have any family members in Japan. He then caught his breath and straightened himself out. While I would like for you to live with your Uncle Might, he probably won't be able to protect you all the time. Living with Izuku would be the best solution, since, if he is strong enough for him to be able to throw this softball across the earth, and have it circle not once, but twice, he could be able to defend you against anyone who would want to cause you harm. Also, I have called his mother and him, and they said they were able to have you for a few years. I started to blush a dark purple, and the realization sunk in. I didn't register him saying that Izuku had thrown it across the earth twice, however, until much later. I have already spoken to his mother on the phone, and I have told her the conditions for you living with him. He then sighed, if you are sure about supporting someone like him, I will be able to convince the other scientists on the island that you will be able to transfer to UA, and I will get your plane tickets. Be ready. I'll be ready, I say as I turn around. Thank you dad, for supporting my dream to be a support hero. Thank you for supporting my decision. I switched my direction to hug him, which makes him tense up for a few seconds, before he calmed down, and hugged me firmly around my shoulders. Now, make sure you are careful while over in Japan. Just because it has a low crime rate due to all might, doesn't mean that you are perfectly safe. Make sure you will stay with him at all times. Yes, I understand dad. I understood what he was thinking. This was the first time I had ever left home. Let me pack up my PC since that would probably be the hardest thing to do. Okay, have a good trip to Japan.
I left to open the door from his office to his hallway, and he went back to his desk, and he started both calling a person to fix the broken window, and the people who would get me the plane tickets. I hope that Izuku would be the person that you think he is, Melissa. He whispered as I exited, before going onto his phone. I had boarded the plane. Well, I hope so too, Dad. I wonder what he told Izuku and his mom. I smirk. He would probably act like an overprotective father, threatening his life, his future, or things like that if he harmed me. I shake my head after imagining what he would say to them. No matter. But, if you were able to throw a softball within 90% of 100 million meters in a world where doing that without a quirk is thought to be impossible, then you truly are something else, Izuku Midoriya. Then, I imagine what he felt, as he had to work hard to achieve that goal. It must be lonely, being quirkless, and, on top of that, being the strongest hero. Izuku POV. I prepared myself for the worst. Everyone was gathering around our teacher, who had reached into his pocket and pulled out a device. I had no idea what it was, but it looked a lot more technological than what our old teachers had. I walked down to where he was and stood towards the very back, already knowing what was going to happen. The bones in my arm were broken, but I wasn't paying attention to that and I was stuck in my mind. So, looks like I am going to be expelled. I think of the hug of my mom earlier that day, the hug from my teacher several months ago, and all the people that have fought for me to be here. I smile, but not in a warm, loving way, but in a bittersweet way. Looks like I will have to become a hero as Saitama did, working my way from the bottom. Still, I wish I could be with some of these people more. I look at the brunette who had stood up for me during my test. She helped me so much. Her smile makes her look beautiful, along with her eyes and upbeat attitude. She is one of the reasons I am even standing here. I directed my eyes to the girl who made the patent for the softball. She is brilliant, can be intense, and has an elegance that many people don't have. I should probably ask her name, but I am not sure it would matter after this moment. I looked at everyone who has stood up for me. The uptight guy, the French person, the guy with red hair like Katsuki. These guys stood up for me, despite everything, and I will be forever grateful for what they have done for me. I looked down after seeing the score. I had gotten first, but, since I didn't get first place in all the events, I would be expelled regardless. I am sorry that you had to waste it on a quirkless person like me. Also, I was lying about expelling someone. I blinked, thinking I didn't hear him correctly. I blinked again. I walked towards the front while limping, which made me walk like a zombie due to the injuries that I had incurred during the test. That was a rational deception meant to bring out the best in you. I looked into his eyes. His eyes looked clouded. It was as if he was lying, and was trying to clear his mind of any thoughts to ward off anyone who was trying to find him out. So I knew he was lying and was trying to cover it up. But before I could say anything, Mr. Aizawa said, But, that isn't to say that there won't be someone who will be punished. Everyone looked at me, either in sympathy for my situation, in anger, as I had been put through every challenge twice and still got a better score than many people, or disgust, as they looked at my broken, bleeding arm that became very apparent as soon as everyone quickly walked back. Mr. Aizawa walked past me, then he walked through the crowd of students. He proceeded to grab someone short and had purple balls for hair out of the crowd and held him to the sky, all while others backed away from our teacher. You were the lowest scorer. I see potential in you. He took in a breath and blinked as the person who was being carried winced in pain. However, I regularly saw you acting irrationally, especially when there were girls around you. So, while you may have the potential, you have to resolve your irrationality and the thoughts that you are the best just because you passed one standardized test. You will be transferred to class 1 degree Celsius. He directed his eyes away from the crowd of students who were looking at him. Your documents about the curriculum and such are back in the classroom. Give him a look. He walked past me again and whispered into the air while passing by me, have recovery girl fix you up. He then took in a deep breath and said, You deserve to be a hero here, but don't think you are the best just because you are the strongest. He gives me a pass to the nurse's office and left to the building, where he and the small kid he was carrying disappeared into it. After I saw him off, I saw the blood pumping out of my wound and passed out, both in relief of passing the test and in the blood loss that had accumulated. Several hours later, my eyes shot open, only to find a lady, who I presumed to be the nurse, healing me. I was in a hospital-like bed, like the bed that I had carried Achako onto when she was injured. So, looks like I am in the nurse's office. Well, let's wait for her to finish healing. Wait, it's already done. I looked to my right, only to see my arm and hand completely healed. No scratches were present, and even the scars looked like they were faded. Huh, looks like you are stronger than the rest. Wait, what? I lifted myself off the bed, and I felt rejuvenated after the sleep, and ready to take on any challenge. I looked at the person who had healed me. She looked short, had gray hair, and carried some candy on her. How do you feel? I feel energized. She looks confused as if I said something she didn't expect. Huh, you are quirkless aren't you? I scratch my head, confused about what she meant. You see, my quirk boosts the healing factor of people, but it usually drains the person who uses it. Eventually, people could die if I used my quirk on them too often. She takes in a breath, calming herself. She sat on the bed and looks downwards, which seemed to be a method to conceal the fact that she was tired. However, that only applies to people who have quirks. People who are quirkless feel rejuvenated after me healing them rather than being drained. 
The reason is that my quirk uses the indicator of a quirk, the one-jointed pinky toe, as a switch of my powers. If the indicator of the quirk isn't there, she started to trail off, but I shook her by the shoulders, which kept her awake. Oh, sorry, I am a little tired. Anyway, if the indicator isn't there, it will drain my energy. She gave me a piece of candy, which I identified to be a Pez candy, shifting the conversation. You should meet up with your friends in your classroom. They were quite worried about you, carrying you all the way here. Wait, who is she talking about? They? Who are they? Is it Achako? The black-haired girl. I put that in my brain's archive of questions to ask later, which has a surprising number of questions in the archive. I leave the nurse's office and look at the time on the watch I had on. It was an Armatron sports watch. I haven't taken off the watch ever since my mother gave it to me as a present after my first tournament win. It's nearly three. I was out for that long. I rushed to my classroom, running at a slower 20 miles per hour pace, only to find it empty. I looked around, where I saw a note on a desk, which I read. Hey, you were out for so long, and I didn't know if you were able to get the papers you needed. I was also kind of worried about you after helping to get you to the nurse's office. I guess I wanted to return the favor after you saved my life, so I got the papers for you, and I left them in the desk under this note. I look under the desk and retrieve the papers, and quickly pack my things together as I read the note. I am sorry I couldn't help you as you helped me. I wasn't able to carry you, so I asked someone else to help me. She had black hair, and she helped me carry you to the nurse's office. I started to imagine the girls carrying me in a crutcher, and them looking at me concerned. My face shifted to a hot pink color as I continued walking out of the school and continue reading the note. Though, I hope that I will be able to repay what you have done for me after saving my life. From, Achako Uraka. I reach the outside, as I see the sunlight up to the school, and me, and as I finish the note. Thank you Achako. You don't have to repay me. I am going to become a hero, after all. The job of a hero is to save others. As I was about to walk back home, I was stopped by someone. How's your arm? I moved so quickly, twisting his arm, moving quickly behind him, and before I knew it, he was on his knees with his arms behind his back. Both of his arms were currently restrained by me, and he was lying on his knees. Oh, I realized what I had done, and I quickly released his arm from my grip, as well as helping him get up. Sorry, force of habit. I bow an apology. It's fine. It was in self-defense. You couldn't have known who I was. I should be the one who is sorry. He bowed down, obviously ignoring the pain he was feeling. Hey, it's okay. I touch his back, indicating him to stand up. He stood up and suddenly became very serious. But I imagined that the person who was transferred wouldn't be that way. I thought he would expel you and him. However, he was transferred to the general course. Our own instructor deceives us like that. I shrugged. Well, that's how our life works. Don't trust people just because of their positions or because of the group they belong in. Trust people based on their knowledge, their skill set, and their personality. His eyes dilated as he looked towards me. Of course, you have taught me a very valuable lesson today, Midoriya. I look at him confused, but then I heard a girl say, You too, heading to the station. Wait up. Oh, Achako's here. Wonder whether I should ask her about her letter. Hey, Achako. I waved to her and stopped where I was. Ah, Infinity Girl. Infinity Girl. I smirk. That's a cool name. So, you are Tenya Ida. She looked at him, then turned her attention to me. Hey, Izuku. Why did Bakugu call you Deku? My expression became somber. That was a nickname he gave to me when he was young. I was defending a girl from his wrath, and he gave me the nickname since that day. In his mind, it means useless. I scoff. Really? I thought that it screamed, do your best. I realized where she got that idea from. Really? That's a new way of looking at it. I smirk. Thanks for the new perspective. I walk forward, along with them, talking about me, Tenya, Achako, and other things. It was fun talking to people. After Tenya left for his station stop, it just left me and Achako. Coincidentally, most of the seats were empty. However, we were still standing up. Hey, Hachako. Hem. She turned her face around, showing me her beautiful face. Thank you for carrying me to the clinic, and thank you for giving me the papers for the school. I take in a breath. Also, you don't have to repay me for anything. It's both my job as a future hero and as a friend of yours. Then I stopped, worried that I said something I shouldn't have based on her cloudy expression. That is, assuming you want to be friends with me. I sounded worried, afraid that I had broken a friendship that I hadn't even gotten yet. No, it's not that. I am your friend. She then sat down on the seat and looked downwards. It's just that. You are so much nobler than I am. She sounded on the brink of tears. You saved my life and expected nothing in return. Not money, not a favor, nothing. You just get the satisfaction by helping others. Then, I heard her start to cry. I was completely unprepared, due to her constant happy vibe, and the warm smile that she burned into my mind. However, I remembered what my mom said all those years ago. I sat down and lifted her chin, cupping her face and wiping off the tears that had stained her face. I thought that I had overstepped my boundaries, but I said anyway. Do you want to be a hero? Huh. Her tears slowed down, as she seemed confused by my actions. Do you want to save others, and put a smile on someone's face, despite the cost? Well, yes, she then cleared her throat and slowed the tears streaming down her face. But, I don't think I am worthy to become a hero. As she came close to the brink of tears again, I say while removing my hands, why not? 
Why don't you think you are a worthy hero? She shivered, because I want to become a hero for the money. She looked over at me as if she thought I would be unsympathetic for what she said, with her eyes being devoid of any life. However, the only expression she had gotten was confusion. Please don't tell this to anyone, but... My family, we're really poor. We run a construction company, but business is bad. She looked at me again, looking to be very uneasy. However, I urged her to continue. I wanted to help out, but my parents wanted me to achieve my dreams first. So, I wanted to become a hero so I could help my parents have easier lives. However, she looked at me again. When you had saved my life, you had done it without any selfish desires, without wanting to prove to everyone that you were the strongest. You even reprimanded them for not doing it before you did. You just wanted me to live, and that was it. But you feel that way too. After all, you defended me along with the other students, and you were one of the reasons that I got into the school. I argued as I lightly held and rubbed her hands to comfort her. At that moment, you were willing to give up your dreams of helping your parents for me to get into UA. If you aren't a hero, then I don't know who is. She looked up, clearing the tears that were pouring down her eyes, and she started to grin softly. Thank you. That means a lot to me. The fact that you think of me like that. That anyone thinks of me like that makes me feel happy. I smiled, matching her happy-go-lucky expression that she usually wore. That's what I felt when you and everyone else had defended me. So it meant a lot to me too. That so many people, even though I was quirkless, believed in me. So, thank you again, for defending me, and for being my friend. Then, she did something unexpected, she hugged me. Putting her chest on mine, she wrapped her arms and hands around me, put her head on my shoulder, and even moved her legs around mine. I was confused and slightly embarrassed by her hugging me in such an intimate way. But before I could say anything, or become embarrassed, the loudspeaker interrupted us. We are just about to arrive at the next station. Again, we are about to arrive at the next station in a minute. I pull away from her hug, which made her look disappointed. Hey, want to exchange numbers so we can talk? Her eyes brightened again. Oh, of course. Here. She lifted out her phone and showed me her phone along with her number. Her phone reflected the sunlight's rays outwards, making the phone look brighter. Huh. Despite her being poor, she has a, not a flagship phone, but definitely a recent one. Looks like the Huawei Honor 8X. I guess her parents really do care about her. We exchanged numbers, and I said goodbye to Achako as I left for my house. For some reason, I was still looking downwards, feeling as lonely as I did from the beginning of the day. It's good to have friends, but I wish there was someone else who's been through what I have. Someone who would comfort me after all that I have been through. I have been lonely for so long due to my quirklessness, but none of these guys really understand that. I chuckle sadly. Now I sound ungrateful. I should be thankful that Tenya, and especially Achako, have become my friend, despite who and what I am. I walked towards my house as I remembered me defending someone from Katsuki. Give up. You are useless, Deku. You will never be able to be a hero, you piece of shit that you are. I chuckled, remembering those days. You couldn't be more wrong, Katsuki. I walk into my house, feeling ready to unwind and do the work for my school. Then, my mom approached me as I walked through the door frame and closed the door. She hugged me, greeting me from my day at school. Izuku, why didn't you tell me that you had a girlfriend in America? My mind blanked. Did someone from my island get the softball from me throwing it? What is happening? What did they do? My mom released me from her grip as I turned around. She answered some of my questions. Her father called and asked if she could go to your school and live with us. She is willing to transfer schools from America to live with you. How romantic. Why didn't you tell me about her? She is here right now. She paused to look at my expression, which spelled out, Izuku. EXE has stopped working. Izuku. I suddenly collapsed onto the floor for the second time that day. I just couldn't take any more surprises. But of course, that wouldn't be the only surprise that day. A few hours later, I groaned, groggily waking up from what I assumed to be a dream. I felt that I was on my bed, so I knew I had been moved from the front door if my memories weren't playing tricks on me. Then, I saw someone patting my head with a cloth and an ice pack, but my vision was blurred, so I couldn't tell who it was. What happened? Was my mom lying to me? No, she never did and never would lie to me like that. So, did someone from America really transfer schools for me? Or maybe my mom just misinterpreted the situation, and though someone who had no place to live and asked a random person to give them a place to stay for a few years. Yeah, that doesn't sound that convincing. So, since I know she isn't my girlfriend, and I know she didn't choose me randomly, then who is she? Why is she here? Then, my vision cleared, and I saw who was helping me. It wasn't my mom, but it was a blonde-haired woman who had pale skin and glasses on her face. Her ocean blue eyes that I saw through her glasses looked concerned, probably for me. Suddenly understanding what was happening, I lifted my head, making the woman's eyes widened in surprise as well as scoot away from me. Eyes as wide as hers, I ask. Who are you? 5.30 a.m. I woke up, preparing myself for school. I changed in the bathroom, brushed my teeth, and walked outside of the house, all without making a single sound. After going to the beach, I ran across it again. I felt the sand filing my toes, scraping against my bare feet. The ocean tide swayed and splashed across the beach, which kept me calm all throughout my run. After running back and forth across the beach, I checked the time. 6 a.m. 
I felt the sound of the ocean waves washing over me, and for that moment, I felt at peace. I sighed. I can't stay here forever. I have to return to the real world someday. The rest of the world isn't this peaceful. So, after cleaning my feet of all the sand, and putting my shoes and socks on that I had brought, I ran back home in a few minutes. I knocked on my room's door, hoping that she was already awake, despite me knowing otherwise. Hey, Melissa. I heard my roommate stir from her slumber. Hmm, I know you are still suffering from the effects of jet lag, but we have to go to school. You have to wake up someday. Hmm, five more minutes. She groaned out, and I chuckled. Well, if you don't wake up and change, we'll be late for school. We have to leave the house by seven maximum. Otherwise, we will be late. I'll make some breakfast when you come out. I walked away to the kitchen. So, what should I make? Something quick, in case she is going to be late. Something that will smell good, and something that will be healthy. It also has to be something she likes. I thought hard. Huh, I guess I didn't ask anything about her when she came over yesterday. Let me ask her what she wants for breakfast. I walked back over to the room, where I still heard the quiet breathing of the girl inside the room. Looks like she still is asleep. Hey, Melissa, what do you want to eat? After a minute, I heard the snoring stopped, and creaking came from inside the room, indicating she had gotten up from her bed. I guess a sandwich would be good. Okay, so, we don't have a lot of ingredients, but we have to manage. Come out in around 15 to 20 minutes then. That way, you can eat your food in peace, and we can go to the station without being late. I rushed towards the kitchen and looked at the time. 6.10 a.m. Well, we do have a few things that I can make. I can make an egg sandwich since we do have a few eggs. However, we don't have bread or anything like that. What I do have is rice, which I can use to make a rice sandwich. Okay, let's see what I can do. Finally, 15 minutes later, my American roommate came out. She looked very tired, with dark circles staining the bottom of her eyes and she walked limply. However, the gray circles under her eyes slowly faded, and she perked up as she smelled what I had cooked. What are you cooking, Izuku? I looked up from the skillet. Oh, since we don't have any bread, I used rice to make rice sandwiches. Sorry, it isn't like a normal sandwich, but I didn't have any bread so, I handed her the dish. Here you go. There is meat, egg, and cheese inside it, so enjoy. I said as I ate my portion. She looked at me eating my many rice sandwiches, then at her sandwiches. Less than a minute later, the many rice sandwiches I had made for her disappeared. She then slightly burped, which made her immediately turn red with embarrassment. Hey, it's okay. I am just glad you liked it. If I hadn't been told just yesterday night that you were coming, I could have done more for you. You literally left one of the most secure and one of the best schools in the world to help me become a hero, and entrusted your life to me, despite not even knowing me. Yesterday. Who are you? Her hands jittered as she had backed away, and her cheeks were brushed red in embarrassment. She also released her grip on the towel that she had previously put on my head, as she put her hands behind her, hiding them from view. Um, and my name I is. She then took a deep breath, collecting her thoughts. As she tried to calm herself, she moved her hands and arms in motion with the rising and falling of her chest after she had moved her hands from behind her to the front of her. My name is Melissa Shield. You might not know. Wait, the Melissa Shield. Of course, I know who you are. I interjected before she could say any more. You're the daughter of Dave Shield, the world-recognized scientist, who had made designs for many hero suits. She blushed, then, refusing to meet my gaze, her eyes darted away from mine and faced the floor as if she just realized that was inside a guy's room, and it had just now sunk into her mind. Though, what are you doing in Japan? And at my house and room specifically? She turned a dark purple, obviously not comfortable with answering what I had asked, but she relented by sitting down next to me, however, her eyes refused to meet my own. I came for you. So, was my mom justified in thinking that she was my girlfriend? No, she probably isn't done speaking yet. She then realized what she had said, and clarified, I I came to help you become the strongest hero. She coughed out, clearing her voice while also hiding her blushing. She stopped a few seconds later, which helped her more clear and confident voice come through. You were able to throw a softball from Japan to I Island, after circling the earth several times. Oh, so that's where it landed. That's a freaky coincidence, isn't it? I sat there, mulling over what she said. But, why me, out of everyone else? It's not like there aren't other strong potential heroes out there and I didn't even get the furthest in the test. She stood up and, finally, her aqua blue eyes faced me, with her clear and confident voice coming through. Because, despite you being quirkless, you have the strength and a drive that no one in the past generation has had. Yet, here you are. Even if you aren't first at everything, you existing at all challenges society's view of people like us, and the fact that we are weaker than everyone else. As a quirkless person myself, I wanted to support that. So, just as my father did with All Might, I will support you throughout your journey to becoming a hero. Wait, you are quirkless. She nodded solemnly. I bit my lip, already thinking about what she had gone through, even at I Island. But I pushed it aside, for now. You left the schools in I Island, transferred to UA, and traveled alone to another country, for me. She nodded again. I knew that a person with that much strength could become a hero, but with the right guidance, I knew that you would become not only a great hero but also one that would spread inspiration to others like us. Ones that feel they are lesser because of what they are born with, that they too can become a hero. 
That is the kind of hero that you can be, and the hero I thought you were. I smiled, feeling joyful that someone just knew who I was without even having a conversation before meeting me. Despite her not meeting me before, it feels like we were long-lost friends, and she heard of my dreams and what I wanted to become. It feels like we are connected, and very few people could know what we have been through to get where we are. That, that was what I was missing in my life. Her, a person who understands what I have been through. Though, one thing didn't make sense. Where are you staying? Did your father book a hotel or something? Then she started to blush again. Since I am valuable to my island, the condition for me to live in Japan was to live with you, since, with your strength, you would be able to defend me from people who would want to hurt me. I also have to sleep in your room with you as well, so no one can attack me in my sleep or kidnap me. A girl is going to live with me and sleep in the same room as me for at least a year. But, oh, okay, I said, not really sure what else to say. Well, wait here. You can sleep on the bed. I left to get a sleeping bag while also mentally hitting myself. Come on. Don't do anything bad to her, and you won't have any reason to be embarrassed. Once I came back to my room's entrance, I heard someone softly snoring. I opened the door, and there I saw my new friend's face relaxed her arms were limply hanging on her side. She must be really tired. She fought so hard to get here, after all. Let me tuck her in. So, after I took off her glasses and set them on the side, I lifted her up. Luckily, she was rather light. I set up the sleeping bag next to the bedside, trying not to disturb or harm her. I saw her shift onto her left side, and curl her legs towards her head. I closed the light and laid down on my sleeping bag. Good night, Melissa. See you tomorrow. I heard someone scurry away from my room as soon as I said, Wait, was my mom hearing in on our entire conversation? At this point, I didn't care anymore. At least she doesn't think that she is my girlfriend anymore. After I finished all of my food, I checked the time. 6.30 a.m. Hey, you got all your things for school. When you get into UA, we have to set you up in the school system. Oh, no need. Actually, after hearing that All Might was going to be a teacher, my dad contacted him and the school board. So, all I need to do is go into UA and get the syllabuses. Wow, you did prepare for me, didn't you? I teased her, which made her immediately blush in embarrassment. Sorry, seriously though, we should leave now. If we leave now, we can get to the train on time, and you'll be able to meet some of my friends before you get into 3 degrees Celsius. Well, you can go ahead. I'll catch up. Okay, but make sure you are careful. I was going to question her, but I also realized that she was still wearing the same clothes from yesterday, so I knew she needed privacy to change. I walked outside my home, and I saw Japan's beautiful spring. Cherry blossoms were blooming, and even though the sun wasn't out yet since the sunrise would happen in about 15 minutes, I could still see everything around me. I looked around the street, breathing in the crisp spring air, which let the feeling of spring enter inside of my lungs. I carried my bag on my arms, as I balanced the weight on my spine and back muscles instead of just on my arms by standing straight. I relaxed, but that relaxation was short-lived as I turned around. Hey, Izuku. I looked behind me as a blonde-haired woman tried to catch up to me. She carried her bag, which looked as if it was overflowing with items. She, however, was not able to balance it at all, which made her pace and position unstable. Wait, Melissa. But I was too late to warn her of anything. She tripped over due to her unstable position and speed, and due to a fallen branch that she slipped on. After dropping my stuff on the sidewalk, I rushed over as she was about to fall on the back of her head. I ran towards her and I wrapped my arms around her midsection and head. Her eyes were still shut in fear as if she was expecting the ground to meet her. Hey, I got you. I got you. Nothing will happen to you now that I am here. Her ocean blue eyes fluttered open, which looked into me. She looked at me. Differently. I wasn't entirely sure, at the time, what that look was, but I remembered the same look from Achako after I had saved her life, and from that black-haired girl after my score was revealed, and I had gotten my score. I realized that my face was inches away from her, and I could visibly see her chest rising and falling as her breathing slowed, so I quickly helped her get up. After I ignored my heavy beating heart and blush, I asked, Are you okay? Are you hurt? Did I hurt you? She shook her head, but instead of looking embarrassed, she looked disappointed and slightly angry. No, I'm fine, let's just go to school now. You sure? Because we have a few minutes. No, let's go now. She walked past me, her voice icy. Okay, let's. Just go then. She walked ahead of me and moved past the bag I had discarded, but she didn't even look at it as she walked by it. Did, did I do anything wrong? I hope I didn't hurt her. I thought as I lifted my bag off the floor. When I had caught up with her, we walked in uncomfortable silence with each other. That continued even as we sat in the train. However, when everyone left for their stops, right before our stop, I decided to break the silence. Hey, why did you walk away after I saved you from falling? Did I do anything wrong? Did I hurt you? Did I make you feel uncomfortable? What if I accidentally touched her inappropriately? That would explain her reaction, where she would feel like she was sexually harassed. I mentally groaned in anguish. After all the things she has done for me, I had to screw it up. Melissa interrupted my mental shaming of myself. No, it's not that. It's just that. I mostly felt like... Her hands were shaking as if she was remembering something traumatic. I looked and felt the same way that I did when my mother had carried me from the street after Katsuki rendered me unconscious. What should I do? But I knew she didn't have to tell me yet. 
I reached over to grab her hands and caress the top of them. She looked me in the eyes with the same expression within her eyes that Achako had yesterday, desperation and anguish. Hey, it's okay. You don't have to tell me anything right now. It's your choice. Her expression shifted. No, since we will be living with me for several years, I should tell you now. She looked away. Please don't tell anyone about this, but I have always been bullied. As a little kid, some people at my school would pick on me because I was quirkless, and always, they would get away with it because I was afraid of what would happen to me. They, the bullies, they called me useless and told that I would never amount to anything right before knocking me out. Over and over again for years. She choked out that last part. Just like Katsuki, I realized how much of a jerk I had been, ignoring what her situation must have felt like. Then, she started tearing up, but she continued regardless. She sucked an air through her teeth as she continued, not facing my eyes. Until Uncle Mike came to America when I was young. When he came to meet me and visit me in school, the bullies stopped. They stopped hurting me, and they acted completely differently. One of them asked me on a date. I thought it was the person wanting to ask for forgiveness, so I accepted it. We went on a few dates, and I, I developed feelings for him. She chuckled sadly. How naive I was. After a few days after when Uncle Mike left, during a dance we had attended, I was leaning backward. However, instead of pulling me up, he dropped me, making me fall on the floor, while saying, why the hell would I ever date a useless, quirkless person like you? Before walking away, and after everyone laughed at me for believing that someone like me could ever be loved by anyone. At the end of her explanation, she started to cry heavily. She dropped her stuff on the floor as I saw many tears leave her face, and I heard her sob, even though I couldn't see her face. I knew what she had felt like, but I still didn't know what to do. I was stunned that a person would ever do that to someone they were dating, but I was also angry. Whether it would be in school, life, or work, people just keep finding ways of making us feel inferior. I realized my friend was still crying, and, finally, I knew what to say and what to do. I hugged my friend's crying self, which she seemed surprised by. Hey, it's okay. Don't worry. I know what you felt like. I rubbed her back softly, which she seemed comforted by due to her slowing down her tears. It must have been hard, keeping up a barrier in front of everyone, where no one would enter. Everyone who thought cared about you up and leaving you, and trying to hurt you, so you kept up a barrier to protect yourself and others from harm, letting no one else in. You buried yourself into your dream to keep yourself from thinking twice about it, and when people seemed to care, you pushed them away. She gasped as if I had read her mind, which slowed the tears that flowed from her face to fall on my shirt. She then gently put her arms around me, reciprocating the hug, and wrapped her legs around me, as if she wanted as much of me comforting her as possible. She buried her face into my shirt and silently cried. I won't be like that bully who will hurt you when you least expect it, and I will protect you from anyone who will try to hurt you. If you ever need to talk to me, you can just ask. I can help you. It's the least I can do for what you have done for me. She lifted herself to move her mouth to my ear and she whispered, Thank you. That, that means a lot. She moved her arms away from me and uncoupled her legs and body away from my own. I turned my legs around to be parallel with the seat, which enabled Melissa to lie down on my shoulder. Wait, she's lying down on me. I turned my head, and I saw my friend looking happily towards my neck and arm. Even though her eyes were still red with dryness, she looked relaxed, which was the exact opposite of what I was currently feeling. My heart rate soared, I was jittery, and I suddenly was aware of her chest rising and falling on my side, as well as her chest rubbing into my arm. Ugh, I should ask her if she should just not lie down on me, but... If I told her that, she would probably feel like I was breaking my promise to not hurt her. Plus, she looks happier. So, who am I to stop her happiness? As long as I can keep my head out of the gutter and think rationally, then I will be fine and so will she. So don't worry. Even though I had told myself not to worry, my heart wouldn't wind down and my blush was ever present. However, as soon as the train stopped, she lifted her head from my shoulder, which helped me calm myself. Let's go to school, Melissa, I say to calm myself and to signal her to get her things off the floor. Yeah, she said, smiling genuinely at me. Her smile made her look like a Chaco. Why am I remembering her right now? I shook my head. Maybe because of her smile, and me knowing what she is hiding under that smile. I should make sure that I am aware of how people around me are feeling. Melissa and I walked to school as we talked about common things, like her hobbies, which were about her love for science and technology, and her dream to become just as great as a support hero as her dad. Her favorite foods, which she admitted were chocolates, her appreciation for technology, which showed me how much she and I knew about GPUs, CPUs, motherboards, storage, and RAM, from the Ryzen 9 3900X launch coming out, to the new Radeon RX 5700XT coming out both in the summer, to the next-gen PCIe 4.0 that was coming out with the new X570 motherboards, to even the new NVMe M2 SSD that was coming alongside the new Ryzen lineup. If anyone overheard us, they would think we were tech geeks, not aspiring heroes. I mentally chuckled. Then, as the school came to sight, and the glass on the building reflected the sun's light, almost in a blinding way. So, I'll see you later Izuku. Bye. Bye Melissa. I waved at her as I left. I had to go to my homeroom classroom.
After remembering where it was, I once again opened the massive door. I saw Achako and the black-haired girl talking to one another, but before I could talk to them, I was immediately stalked by a guy with yellow hair. Why is he swarming me right now? I kept my stuff on my desk as he said, Hey, who's that hot American chick who you were talking to? Can you do me a solid by introducing me to her? He said while leaning on my arm. After remembering what she told me, I felt protective over Melissa. After my stuff was on my desk, my face morphed into a cold and serious expression. No, I am not going to introduce her to someone like you when you don't even know who she is. I looked at him with a smile that would make me look like a proud killer. So why don't you go back into your seat before I kill you where you stand? Let me just say that I am well versed in how to kill a person. I know one way I can kill you right now while using your arm. He backed up in horror as if he hadn't expected me to say that. He quickly retracted his arm from my shoulder and ran back to his seat while the entire classroom looked at me in surprise. I mean, it was true. I learned pressure points in the major blood vessels in the body, but I wouldn't have actually. Oh, who am I kidding? I just screwed up again. People will now think I am a terrorist. I mentally groaned. Then I remembered. Actually, no. He needed to be scared. If I didn't scare him, he could have hurt Melissa without any consequences. At least he'll remember that he will face consequences from me. Our homeroom teacher came in, interrupting my justifications. It took you less than three seconds to quiet down. Looks like what I said made it into your thick skulls. Then the rest of the class happened. I found out the black-haired girl's name was Momo Yeirazu after attendance, along with the name of the yellow-haired guy as well, who was Denki Kaminari. English was easy, along with the other classes. So, after those were done, I started to ask myself, what is that actual difference between regular school and UA? This is supposed to be a super elite school, but these classes aren't that challenging. What makes this school different other than the amount of funding they have? Then, I rushed to lunch, where they served a lot of food. I chose several Momo Yakitoris, mostly so I could have them in a hurry if I needed to have them quickly, even if they were a little on the heavy side. Hey, can I sit here? I asked Yeirazu, who sat far away from everyone else. Huh, I just realized her first name is the same as the food I am eating. Well, whatever. She probably doesn't want me in her face. Of course you can. She patted a place next to where she was sitting, which surprised me, but I took up nonetheless. Hello, Yeirazu. Is that your last name? Wait, isn't that the name of the famous hero family? She nodded. Then, having a profound interest in the cafeteria's floor, she looked downwards. Wow, so many amazing people come into the school. You, think so? She asked in the same voice that Melissa and Achako had when they were talking to me. Yeah, other than Ida, you are quite possibly the only person with merits in the real hero world in this class. That is amazing. While looking at the floor, a red blush appeared on her cheek, which made her finally look up, just made her look at a fascination at the wall on the other side of the cafeteria. While I was finishing my food, I asked Yeirazu, though, what's with this school? I thought this was going to be a dog-eat-dog -dog education system, where only the strongest and smartest survive, but, at least until now, the school has been pretty laid back. No expelling for failing to answer correctly, no one is expelled for not being on time, and the teachers, while a few of them are tough on us, most of them aren't. As she turned around, all traces of her blush disappeared faster than someone could snap. She looked at me in pity, as if I had no idea what was to come, and I was an innocent kid. Wait, why are you looking at me like that? Then, before she could answer me, the bell rang, which signaled the end of lunch and the beginning of the afternoon classes. She ignored my question and left without warning. Seriously, what is so special about this school, Yeirazu? I walked back to my classroom, opening the huge door. Mostly everyone was here. All the students looked at me as I came through the door. Kaminari's face was contorted in fear. Bakugu looked like he was seeing red. Hachako had a smile that outburned the sun. Yeirazu looked at me with pity, and the rest of the students looked at me in awe. Then, as I sat down, I heard someone from the door. I am. The person said while he slammed the door open, coming through the door like a normal person. I chuckled since that wasn't how people came through doors, but I eventually shut up so people didn't give me weird looks. He walked up to the front of the classroom and flexed his muscles. So this is hero basic training. The class that'll put you all through all sorts of special training to mold you into heroes. No time to dally. Today's activity is this. He faced towards the rest of the classroom while he took out a sign that said battle. Team battle training. Everyone in the room cheered. But it seemed like All Might wasn't finished. And for that, you'll all need these. All Might pointed towards the wall while he pressed a button. The entire section of the wall started to expand outwards, revealing numbered boxes. Wait, what? Was it there the whole time? In accordance with the quirk registry and the special request forms you filled out before being admitted. But before he could finish, all the students stood up excitedly. Costumes. Y-A-H-H-H. He cleared his throat before turning around. After you've changed, come out in ranking order to ground beta. Looking good is very important, ladies and gentlemen. Look alive now, because, from today on, you're all heroes. He left the room, which sparked everyone to go to their number. I found out that there were 18, not 19, which meant that I didn't have my costume. Why? I did all the forms. Where is the... And then my thoughts were interrupted as a blonde-haired girl opened the door quickly. It was Melissa wearing the UA school uniform. She looks really cute in the uniform. 
I snapped out of my temporary fantasy as I realized what was happening. Melissa. I ran towards her. What are you doing here? Don't you have to go to lunch soon? I saw her face look away, which was weird, considering whenever I talked to her, she looked at me. I noticed that her hands were carrying something behind her back. Well, I already ate, so my teacher said that I could give you the costume that I made directly to you, as well as seeing how the design works. She removed one of her hands from the costume she was holding behind her back as she presented the costume to me. Here is the costume you ordered. Exactly as you ordered. I saw that it was wrapped in plastic and that it was green and black, which were my favorite colors. Thank you, Melissa. Also, I dug through my bag to give her some food I got from Lunch Rush. I found a BLT they served and gave it to Melissa. Here, have this. Let me get changed so we can go. She looked at me confused as if she were saying, How did you know that I haven't eaten yet? But I went to the bathroom so I could change. When I changed, I looked at what the costume looks like. As I ordered, it is form-fitting, but I tried walking around the bathroom. When I try to move, it adjusts and is flexible. It feels more like a second skin than a costume. It's probably made of graphene. Then, in the mirror, I looked at my belt. I also asked them to include my third-degree black belt, which I sent over to the school, and they did. It looked amazing, but it also serves another purpose. I wrapped my hands with the gauntlets, which were held up by my black belt. It can hold my gauntlets, which, if I remembered correctly, has a mini-computer inside of it that charges over solar energy, hence the graphene-made costume, which would monitor my health and my heart rate as well as my location, and would send it over to the people who are in my contacts, in this case, Achako, Melissa, and my mom. That way, they can see if I am safe and if I need help. I smiled in the mirror while tightening and hardening my fist. Looks like your teachings will help me, Master Bang. I imaginarily bowed towards him. Thank you. I walked out, where I saw Melissa had waited patiently. So, what do you think? The costume you made for me, it's amazing. Thank you. I hugged her as a thank you since she seemed to like my hugs, surprisingly without any blush from me. She seemed surprised by my actions, but she snuggled against me comfortably. After a few seconds, I pulled away and asked, but how did you finish it in such a short amount of time? She looked at me smugly. I'll tell you later. For now, let's go. She held my hand and turned around as she pulled me across to the ground beta where All Might said we should go. After she dragged me out of the building, still holding my hand, she took me to ground beta where all the students were huddled. She reluctantly released my hand somewhere and disappeared. All the students there had huddled around All Might, but as soon as my footsteps had been heard along with Melissa's, everyone turned around to see me. In a fighting stance, with both my hands out and opened, while I was crouching down towards the floor, ready to deal with whatever people would throw at me. I wonder what we're going to do. I smirked crookedly. Maybe this is the challenge that Yayurazu was talking about. Hey, Izuku. My head turned to the voice of a brunette. Cool costume. It looks really practical. I noticed what she was wearing, which was skin-tight spandex suit, one that was not only colored pink and black, but it also accentuated the curves of her body while gripping tightly to her chest and the rest of her body. I ended up slightly looking at her chest, but I realized how perverted I looked, which made me immediately blush, and it made me look directly at her face instead of her body. Achako rubbed the back of her head while her face turned slightly red. I wish I had been more specific on my request form. The suit so puffy and curvy. I cleared my throat, which did a decent job with getting me distracted away from her chest and body. Well, you can always change it if you want, but I think having it be tied on you would help your mobility, and since it is cushioned, you will get more protection from attacks from your suits. So, if you think about it, they actually did a good job trying to make a suit that would not only show who you are, someone who admires 13, but also someone different from her, and all while being very good at protecting you from someone trying to hurt you and it makes you look cool too. Somehow, I managed to say all of that without looking at her chest or even without becoming a blushing mess. I was semi-proud how, in the past few days, I was able to interact with people a lot easier, considering my interactions with people within these past 10 years has been limited. Huh. Achako started randomly blushing even more while shaking her hands in front of her face. Wait, how did you know? I was overwhelmed with how quickly her expression changed, while I discarded my statement that I had gotten better at interacting with people. Before I could answer her, All Might called to everyone. We're all here, then, looking good. Then, he looked at me for a few seconds, with a look of familiarity. I was confused by his look, but he discarded it as he tried to explain what he had brought us out here for. He explained that our team battle would involve one group, the villains, guarding a nuclear weapon, while the hero team would try to either capture the villain team or secure the weapon under the hero team's control. After he explained everything, he pulled out a box which was labeled lots. Your battle groups will be decided by drawing lots. Tenya asked, wait, is that really the best way? I answered for all might. Well, in the real world, we will have to learn how to work with other people, even if we don't know them, and be able to save people in any situation. I see Midoriya. I apologize for getting ahead of myself. My mistake. All Might shrugged it off. It's fine. Let's just get to it. I picked up a lot, which had the letter A on it. Many other students went after me, getting the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, or J. Hey, I got it as well, Izuku. Must be fate. Let's do this. Then, someone I didn't expect came to Achako and me, Yayurazu. 
I have also got an A. Oh, right, there's an odd number of students. Since that guy who got the lowest score was demoted from class. Then I realized that Yeyurazu was wearing clothes that barely covered her chest and left little to fantasy. Her costume was red, and it had two red straps that covered her breasts, and I was later told that she designed it that way so her quirk could be utilized more easily by exposing her skin. But at the time, I was embarrassed by her costume look. It's her choice to wear it. I shouldn't be looking at her inappropriately. Also, maybe her quirk needs exposed skin, so I just have to make sure I look at her face. I forced myself to look away from her body and at her face, and I succeeded, but I was blushing pretty heavily. Luckily, before I acted stupidly, or before the girls around me could question me, All Might came in to say, moving on, he reached his hands into boxes, which said hero and villain. First up are, he pulled out his hands out of the boxes, which revealed two letters, D as the villains and as the heroes. These, I realized that Team D had Bakugou in it based on him reacting when he saw his team letter. His team, which had Tenya in it, went inside the building per All Might's instructions to defend the weapon. Achako, Yeyurazu and I were outside the building, while we memorized the blueprints. So, looks like it isn't too elaborate, I say after memorizing the building. The girls memorized the blueprints shortly after I did. As soon as Yeyurazu did, she looked at me. So, what kind of plan do you want to execute? She said to me while her hands were crossed over her chest. Wait, me. Why me? Well, you are the person who found out that our teacher was a pro hero, even though no one recognized him. Achako came in. Well, that was me looking at signs that he was giving off, and he is still a registered hero. I am not good at planning. I shake my head. Yeyurazu and Achako visibly pouted. Well, is there anything you can tell us beforehand? About Tenyu or Bakugu? Yeyurazu came in. Well, yes. I know that Bakugu will try to attack me first. He will try to actually kill me. First, he will send an explosion to warn me that. Here's K-A-T-S-U-K-I. Then he will attack with his right arm. Changing his attack pattern slightly so I don't know what he is thinking. But once he gets pissed off enough, he will use more of his quirk to kill me. Yeyurazu and Achako had their mouths to the floor with my assessment. Wait, what? He will try to kill you. More importantly, why are you unfazed by that? Achako screeched. Because I know that I will be able to survive against him. Then, in my mind, everything clicked. Bakugou's behavior, the blueprints of the building, how I could deal with it, my teammates, and everything else. Actually, scratch what I said. About not having good planning skills. I think I might have a plan. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through what if quirkless opus Deku got harem. I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout-out to American Theorist Bros for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works, the link is in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Quirky What If for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.